Uh, before we thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, before we kick off, uh, we did just want to start with a quick poll. Um, for the Emerging Technology Community of Interest, who is hosting this summit today uh, to gather everyone's feedback on what kind of events you are seeking from ACT IAT and from the Community of Interest. So uh, we would appreciate if everyone could just take a, a few moments to respond to the poll, and this feedback will help inform um, the events coming out of the COI over the next year um, and also inform some of the uh, workshops and projects and initiatives that all of the working groups for the COI are putting together. Um, and we have several working groups, including today's blockchain working group, the artificial intelligence working group, Internet of Things working group, um, and many others. And so we appreciate your feedback. We'll leave this poll up for just a few moments and then we'll get started. All right. Thank so, you so much, everyone, for um, your responses. Fred, I will hand the mic over to you. Yeah, one quick uh, thing. Do we have a way to mute everybody, or can I ask everybody who I uh, still see some unmuted uh, microphones to uh, mute your microphones, please? And then we start. Thank you. OK, let's start. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us for today's Actaia Blockchain uh, Use Case Summit. We appreciate uh, everyone taking the time to be, with, to be here with us. My name is uh, Frederick Devo, CEO of Prometheus Computing. I am the Industry Vice Chair of the Emerging Technology Community of Interest and Co-Chair of the Blockchain Working Group. I will be your host for today's summit, and I will be interacting with the speakers and you to facilitate the discussion. This event is part of our Emerging Technology Community of Interest use case series. It enables us to inform the work we do uh, in our working groups with the real life examples. For instance, this working group I published a few years ago, a primer to better understand what blockchain is or is not, and a playbook based on the GSA M3 playbook to lay out a framework for integrating blockchain based solution within use cases. Now that organizations have more experience with regard to blockchain adoption, there is no better time to take a fresh look at the playbook and to go from an abstract series of phases and key activities to a more tactical approach specific to different domains within and across organizations. Uh, we will be kicking off the planning of the blockchain playbook 2.0 in the coming month, and we call on you to join us in this endeavor. We welcome problem statements from agencies who may be able to leverage the playbook. Without further ado, let's get started. Uh, today, we have Carol House opening the keynote to welcome everyone and share some insights on what we will be covering uh, during today's summit. Carol House is an executive in residence at Terran Adventures. She recently served as the director for cybersecurity and secure digital innovation for the White House National Security Council. Welcome, Carol. Hello, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much. And thanks to the ACT IAC community for inviting me to speak with you all today. Um, it's great to be here virtually uh, to share some thoughts um, that, that I have on shaping the future of responsible development of distributed ledger technologies um, and digital assets and the challenges that they face. So very excited about the content that you'll all be discussing here today. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity, especially to showcase some of the issues that I've seen across legislative, regulatory, White House vantage points um, on cyber and emerging tech related to DLT, um, and also underscore just how excited I am um, and how I feel about the Biden administration and what the US government is currently doing to really lean in and examine and address some of these key challenges. So first, I'll highlight that there's an incredibly complex landscape of policy, legal, 
national security, economic, and technological issues that serve as the strategic backdrop and setting for blockchain and digital asset development right now. There are critical challenges that continue to present themselves in blockchain ecosystems around identity, privacy, discoverability, resilience, regulation, and these issues are not just the responsibility of one sector, both public and private sectors, both inside the United States and internationally, hold the capabilities and the responsibilities to help ensure the responsible development of these technologies and related assets. So neither government nor industry can do, these, can do this alone. So today I'll share some perspectives on some of the most critical capabilities and responsibilities that can hopefully help drive the technological and policy developments for the future of DLT systems um, and create some interesting backdrop for the great discussions that are happening later today. Um, and ultimately will help the space um, drive and realize the incredible potential of the innovative technology while also addressing the very real and present challenges and risks. So first I'll address, I'll address two things. Um, first, really set the stage for the critical importance of innovation, um, including to support better government development and delivery of critical services to the public, um, as well as to drive US competitiveness. And then second, finally, I will highlight some of the key challenges that I see related to blockchain use cases and solutions, um, which both government and industry will have to address through innovation and experimentation, through application of technologies, governance, and policy. So many of these were highlighted actually in GAO's technology assessment of blockchain last year. Uh, so very excited to see so many uh, GAO speakers that'll be featured later. Um, specifically, the challenges that I'll be pointing to will uh, underscore cybersecurity and resilience challenges, standard setting and interoperability, workforce expertise, illicit finance and consumer exploitation, um, identity privacy and discoverability, and then finally, decentralization and accountability. So if you take away just one thing from my time speaking to you today, let it be that uh, getting innovation in the DLT space right requires partnership and understanding on both government and industry sides. So first, I mentioned I would really speak to um, the story of innovation. Um, innovation is a core feature and sits at the heart of the US economy. Um, innovation drives how we generate jobs and opportunities, how we seek and grow new industries, how we, uh, the United States, maintain global economic leadership and competitiveness. However, we also know that responsible innovation does not mean unchecked technological advancement without regard to implications for society's security and democratic values. On the government side, those capabilities and responsibilities often take the form of the government playing as regulator and enforcer of, uh, um, against unsound and criminal practices, um, enabling broader industry and government um, advancement through setting standards and supporting research and development, um, as well as through promoting trade, education, and adoption. So each of these roles from the government is critical. The Department of Commerce spoke to each of these and the criticality of consistent public-private sector engagement and coordination in the recently published uh, report for responsible advancement of US competitiveness in digital assets and their underlying tech. This was the first ever competitiveness framework for digital assets and DLT launched as a part of the White House led comprehensive framework for responsible development of digital assets. Um, and it emphasized key areas like research and development and standards work that really are a core piece of the discussions today and focus of the work that ACTIAC is um, undergoing. As we know, regulatory frameworks are also a part of US government blockchain solutions. Regulators for years have leveraged mechanisms to better understand and enable innovation, whether through FinCEN's Innovation Hours Program, the SEC's FinHub, Lab CFTC, um, as well as grants that some of the, the key R&D agencies have supported uh, for development of privacy-enhancing technologies and blockchain analytics solutions. Agencies have also been directly experimenting in using blockchain technology for years. I remember fondly um, a few years ago when colleagues at HHS received the first ever US government APO or authority to operate for blockchain systems. The DOD is experimenting uh, with IBM on use of blockchain for defense supply chains, OPM exploring blockchain solutions to support cross-agency HR functions. There's a lot of different experimentation and innovation undergoing right now across the interagency. 
The U.S. government has also announced uh, some supporting R&D efforts related to DLT um, recently as a part of that White House-driven effort. For example, the National Science Foundation just committed to build um, a, a digital assets research and development agenda, um, as well as to back research that supports digital systems that are usable, inclusive, equitable, and accessible. I think that's huge for there to be a comprehensive, coordinated research and development agenda uh, driven by the NSF, but working with all the other R&D agencies and also with the White House, including the Office of Science and Technology Policy. In this year's U.S. government multi-agency research and development priorities memo, the White House also listed financial technologies, um, which they previously outlined in the critical emerging technologies list to include digital assets, distributed ledger technologies, and digital identity infrastructure, all as priority technologies for agencies to collaborate on R&D efforts. So there's a lot of impetus behind establishing this area as a policy priority across the interagency. And I really look forward to seeing uh, what fruit is born out of those efforts um, in establishing this as a real priority. So this kind of approach to stoking experimentation with technology and governance and use cases in DLT is critical to figuring out how US competitiveness and emerging tech will also build in features accounting for policy goals like democratic principles and security. It requires candor, substantive expertise, humility, and resilience on all parties, government and industry, to get this right. Everyone has to come to the table being willing to share experiences, lessons learned, and being open to other opportunities for innovation, whether on the policy or the technology side. Experimentation will allow us to explore what the best solutions are for each DLT application based on its specific use, because these designs are, are various. There's thousands of implementations already, and all the vulnerabilities and, and the benefits of the features, just like any software, are based on how these systems are designed and operated. So going through the stack, um, there's lots of opportunities for building in features around security and compliance that can address a lot of the core challenges that we'll talk about later, whether they're through governance controls and token distribution, securing mining hardware, peering version control, integrating DNS whitelists, ensuring block headers and fields are transmitting necessary information. You can create registries for trusted dApps or virtual asset service providers or build in digital identity and transaction thresholds at the user level. There are so many options and innovations in, inside of these technology ecosystems at various layers, whether at the market and user layers, um, down to the network um, or even the protocol layers. There are so many options and innovations happening right now that can address these key challenges that so many of these systems have faced and that have impacted so many users negatively. So having now discussed responsibility and capability across industry and government to support that responsible innovation here, um, let me speak briefly on a couple of the key challenges that I think will shape the future of responsible development of DLT systems. And I look forward to listening to the conversations later to see if everyone else sort of feels the same way or what the right answers and solutions are to some of these key challenges. Um, first and foremost, obviously, I'm a cybersecurity person, so I have to emphasize the cybersecurity and resilience challenge that we have absolutely seen with decentralized networks um, so far in this space. So as discussed earlier, the design of DLT systems, including technological or governance designs, will ultimately set the stage for what the relevant vulnerabilities and benefits of the system are. So many people talk about how these systems are totally secure, they're immutable, decentralized. It's important to keep in mind that none of these features are generally binary. They exist on a spectrum. Nothing is completely immutable. It just may be very difficult or impractical um, or even improbable to be able to change. But it's important to have enough technical understanding of the implementations that, that you could possibly design or are currently operating to understand how the system would be exploited. Cybersecurity and resilience of these systems are fundamentally dependent on those design choices that are made in DLT applications. Industry has been suffering the consequences of not building in appropriate security from the beginning and thinking about the, the, those aspects, an issue that the cybersecurity and traditional software communities have known well and been facing consequences of for years. 
billions of dollars were lost last year alone just in hacks, smart contracts, and decentralized finance. So cybersecurity and resilience of this ecosystem is really a core issue. Um, and that actually flows nicely into the next key challenge about standard setting and coordination, since standard setting could help address some of those cybersecurity and resilience challenges. Um, government entities and NGOs, including GAO and World Economic Forum, have pointed to the fragmented and highly uncoordinated efforts on standards and collaboration on solutions internationally. Standards that focus on and enable aspects like interoperability and identity and security are critical to leveraging the full benefits of decentralized systems and enabling the kinds of higher order developments of DLT that a lot of the visionary a lot of the visionaries in this space want in order to better support the future digital economies. There is also a need for greater targeted coordination across governments for experimentation and solutions, whether uh, exploring central bank digital currencies, use of DLT potentially, or considering application for cross-border use of digital identities or supply chain tracking, as, as well as across industry to come and examine what innovations really are worth having standards based upon them right now, or what really require further refinement and agreement across the sector. There isn't necessarily a lot of agreement yet that necessarily provides the basis for standard setting um, at the moment that if done too early could really stifle the right kind of innovation that could bring out the best that the technology has to offer and to enable the critical features like compliance that we need in the ecosystems to combat criminal and cyber exploitation. The next core issue, a problem both for government and for industry, is around workforce and expertise. I know that's important to many of the people on this uh, uh, on this call. Um, as in the world of cyber, workforce across government and industry is needed that has technical and policy and operational understandings related to these technologies. It's not just technical, it's also policy. And traditionally, the government has been um, has been good on policy and industry best on tech. Um, but ultimately, both sides have a lot of great expertise that they've learned from each other um, and people that are and incredible technologists, um, including a lot of the people that are working uh, in the act IAC work right now. Um, so as with other technology areas, both sides really benefit from having individuals from the other side and who have and who have understandings of what both industry and government are doing and can do in this space to help to improve their mutual understanding. I don't think that the cryptocurrency space would have made some of the key areas of progress that it has today towards compliance and combating financial crime. It had not been for some of the really incredible U.S. US government personnel that have left the government and gone to the crypto space to help the sector evolve. Now, of course, the government needs more expertise, and there's a lot of really wonderful people that remain in government in this space, but we need there to be that expertise going in both directions. Another key challenge remains illicit finance and consumer exploitation, a critical priority for the administration, as we've seen in recent actions that have been taken, law enforcement actions um, re related to major exchanges um, and operators of illicit exchanges that have facilitated activity, um, like, for example, Russian-related um, ransomware money laundering and narco-trafficking, like the Bitslato action that was taken recently. So financial applications of DLT systems have been rife with vulnerabilities that are exploited in money laundering and other illicit finance that have exploited consumers and investors, all underscored also in the recent collapse of FTX. The, vulner the vulnerabilities generally that they exploit are the absence of identity. We'll get into that in a second when we talk about the privacy and identity challenge. But generally, the, the U.S. already regulates the digital asset space for issues like money laundering and any financial institution that uses blockchain technologies to support their activities um, in potentially not through cryptocurrency but through other applications are still covered because it's a technology neutral regulatory regime for the most part. Um, so financial institutions can use these innovative technologies but the requirements to understand their customers to understand identify and prevent money laundering risk on their platforms remains in place. Um, however, compliance remains a persistent issue, and it's all compounded by an industry sector that's not sufficiently scaling and coordinating efforts to combat this crime, as well as, most importantly, a lack of sufficient um, enforcement in the U.S. and especially internationally to ensure that the financial system is safeguarded. 
an educated workforce will help to address this enforcement challenge, um, will help the industry to design systems and operate systems that are more compliant, um, ultimately having more educated workforce on both industry and government sides are critical to accomplishing that mission and safeguarding systems that use DLT platforms. Next, the identity, privacy, and discoverability challenge. Well, for years, many people claimed that blockchains were anonymous misunderstandings perpetuated in the crypto space, we know that isn't the case. Blockchain technology inherently is useful for things like auditability and data integrity. It's in fact other features of these systems, like the absence of building in critical identity or financial systems um, to defend against things like fraud and sanctions evasion, um, or even the implementation of obfuscating encryption on top of the DLT that can make crypto pseudonymous or anonymous. While many discuss the benefit of public ledgers, to many, the public nature of the ledger, especially if broadcasting one's financial transactions, is a bug, not a feature of systems like Bitcoin, um, and would certainly be a concern in the context of other applications, like, for example, healthcare or digital identity. These applications are made even more complex by the fact that DLP applications can enable both value and information transfer on the same rails. And value and information transfer generally take very different approaches to identity information that should be available and discoverable to prevent exploitation. We don't feel the same way about identity being available in financial systems as we do in internet activity and activity. To get blockchain use cases right, they will have to account for appropriate features of privacy, um, as in data that is discoverable by certain parties under certain protections and permissions, um, anonymity and discoverability. All of these must strike the appropriate balance. And then finally, a key, a key, a really key issue, and I'm curious to see how uh, how folks talk about it later um, for the future of DLT systems is around decentralization, personhood, and accountability. In this closing thought and closing challenge. The most critical issue in DLT and decentralized networks is really around ensuring proper accountability. One thought leader in the space I heard took issue with the framing that DLT systems are ones that are trustless, um, saying that that's not really accurate. It's just a redirection or a choice of where your trust is, as in trusting smart contracts or software instead of people or institutions. We've seen too many instances of decentralized systems that are exploited for their lack of accountability, like in the hacks that I spoke about earlier. I expect the US government will continue to take actions to enforce such accountability in the DeFi space to include likely more actions like the UkiDAO action CFTC took last year. Any truly decentralized systems will have to address this key issue of accountability in the ecosystem whether through um, imposing industry standards and consequences on each other, potentially defining new intermediaries, um, potentially inadvisable and probably unlikely, but putting costs on end users. There's different ways to impose accountability, um, but ultimately the choices will be up to industry and government to see what happens based on how the risk evolves. And they'll have to address this risk issue of accountability because they're, they're either regulated already and required to do so, or simply because they'll have to establish accountability to convince consumers that their systems are worthy of use and that users will have recourse if their assets are stolen. This is not just a critical issue for regulators. I truly believe that accountability in decentralized networks and systems is fundamental to safeguarding systems, whether financial or protecting other sensitive or high value data or transactions and will set the conditions for driving broader adoption in these technologies. So I hope these insights were helpful in setting the stage for a fantastic discussion across the panels later today. Looking forward to listening in. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Carol, for your insights. Uh, we'll uh, take a quick four minute break and then uh, we'll have uh, Joshua um, Hakakian uh, program specialist at uh, the National Artificial Intelligence Institute, uh, kicking off with the final one. See you in a few minutes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Joshua Hakakian. Uh, I'm very excited to be here with you all this morning. Please excuse me if I have to stop and take a few moments to, uh, to cough or take a breath. Um, I'm very excited to be here with uh, our esteemed panel this morning, and today's panel is going to cover blockchain and government, what is the current state. I'd like to just take a moment 
and introduce each of our panelists today. We have Mark Cantor, the Assistant Director for Information Technology and Cybersecurity from the Government Accountability Office. Uh, Mr. Ted Coyle, Chief Innovation Technologist at Oracle. And Ms. Jennifer Franks, the Director of Information Technology and Cybersecurity at the Government Accountability Office. So my name is Joshua Hakakian. I'm the um, a program specialist at the National Artificial Intelligence Institute in uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs. I'm also the government co-chair for the Blockchain Working Group at ACTIAC. Um, and uh, I'm just very pleased to be here and honored to be here today. So I'll be your moderator for today's panel. Uh, thank you all for being here today. And I'd like to go ahead and kick us off. So um, my first question is for um, Mark Cantor from the GAO and it's around standards and security. So the GAO blockchain report mentions that a lack of interoperability and common standards creates a, a serious limit to implementation. Uh, and that's not even, you know, not to mention the cybersecurity controls uh, such as NIST special publication 800-53, for example. We've heard Carol House speak a bit towards uh, both standards and security and I would love to hear uh, your take, Mr. Kantner, on um, the GAO's approach and the, the GAO's thoughts or, or your thoughts on these topics. So I'm going to take the standards questions <laughs> for Mark. Sure. Um, he'll cover oversight. Um, okay. And so um, to answer the question, um, given that this is a new technology and there are certain considerations, given that the standards kind of cross varying regulatory industries, you have to really consider um, everything that needs to be developed in order to really ensure that the interoperability components are effective, right? Um, and this would also include the implementation of data security and even the privacy related controls that are going to be used and needed in order to manage the systems that support um, the full blockchain ecosystem. Um, and then if you think about the other side of things, in large, this framework, there are standards that actually already exist that would help us to move towards this, this policy-driven direction that we're actually seeking. Um, so if you're considering like the, the software design lifecycle that we already know exists for supporting system and application lifecycle needs. Um, there is a crucial upgrade path that all the systems and the applications must um, complete in order to maintain the full application that is needed to comprise their work. And this is foundational for every lifecycle design. So system owners and integrators would need to really consider not just what it is today, but then how the life cycle of those applications are actually designed. And then what will be needed for the full duration of their life cycle, of their environment, if you're really wanting to conceptualize the full blockchain. Thank you, Ms. Franks. You're that welcome. Makes, uh, you're welcome. That certainly makes sense. What what are some good pathways that may, maybe our folks in industry or academia can help government uh, to try to, um, you know, sort of spur development in the setting of standards and uh, and some of the security concerns? I think some of the ways um, that some of the industries can look at. Are, are some of the, the policies and, and the development that we need to institutionalize. The blockchain area is one that is so large and is so vast, and it's also really decentralized at this time. All of the sectors are, are very much within their own compartmentalized network. So we're gonna have to create policies to really bridge all of these sectors together to figure out how do we streamline the necessary policies to communicate across the sector so that the academics and, and the governments, the state and localities, all of the, the non-financial institutions and the financial institutions have a way to actually streamline the necessary communications that are gonna be needed to create this interoperable approach so that as we're communicating across the different segments that one industry is not having 
a leg up across the other industries that we're able to actually seamlessly be able to really standardize some of the operating procedures. This would also help some of the industry related regulators, some of the privacy related concerns as well. Well, thank you, Ms. Franks. Um, so Ted, Mr. Coyle, I'd like to bring it over to you. Um, thank you as well for being here. So I wanted to talk to you about um, education and undefined benefits and costs. So you are our, um, our industry person on this panel. And what we've sort of seen is that one of the barriers uh, to adoption has been identified as a limited understanding of the technology, the architecture, options, solutions, uh, et cetera. Much of this technology and structure is so nuanced that even folks who are accustomed to this space can struggle to simply find the right question to ask. In your experience, have you and or Oracle uh, been able to approach and address this knowledge gap um, when connecting with folks in the federal space, whether they be end users, technical folks, policymakers? And are there any resources that you use as a baseline for this type of process, whether it's a, some sort of blockchain introduction manual, uh, from Oracle or referencing the GAO report, uh, the ACT Act, Primer and Playbook. How have you been able to approach and address this knowledge gap, Ted? Hey, Josh, good morning. Um, there's a lot there. Uh, and, and sometimes I have to kind of take a step back. I think um, two, two things, um, or maybe three. Uh, number one, nobody knows what we're talking about most of the time when we get into uh, ledger-based systems. Uh, and so I... Uh, my role, I have to speak about this all the time. So I've, I've really summed it up to be uh, I get an identity play at this point. Um, Act I Act, I think is where I've been going to for the particularly uh, the primer and some of the, uh, the, uh, the notions around uh, what, what blockchain is. I've, you know, uh, I, I know that Greg is gonna be speaking later. I know that you know, we've just heard from Carol. Uh, these the, and, and the videos in ACT I Act, I think that's a lot of where I've been uh, focused on, particularly for the federal government. And the reason being that the federal government, in some sense, is very insular, right? So, uh, you know, if I, I, I get to cover, you know, Canada, the US, uh, federal civilian, uh, as well as state and local. And so, where that, well, the reason why I, I bring that up as being important is I'm seeing less interest on the federal side and maybe more, um, more interest at a policy level. Uh, than say an actual implementation level, and we've, and if anybody uh, on on this call or or folks are interested uh, in really getting uh, down into like who's doing what, I, I really believe Act I Act uh, is is a fantastic educational tool. The videos are out there, and people that are actually doing the work are speaking uh, uh, to the group continually. So I, I I'm not trying to to pump up the the uh, the group that much, but in in some sense. Uh, it's it's a fantastic place to go to uh, show and tell uh, what's really happening uh, without me having to con continually try to elaborate or explain if that helps. Oh, certainly, Ted. And, uh, you know, we certainly appreciate that that feedback um, based on, you know, your sort of interactions with folks in the in the private sector and through these types of um, whether they be, you know, business acquisitions or whether they're, um, you know, panels such as this, what are some some of the typical questions that you see that sort of uh, require that um, that barrier breakdown, or some some questions that come up where people are either genuinely curious or looking to overcome a stigma? What are some of the common lines of thought that you've had to sort of dispel? I think the most common one is that it's not crypto, uh, you know, so so the bifurcation being able to be able to uh, and I think even Carol mentioned uh, some of this in the 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 tokenomics and tokenization and value. Uh, I think that's the the biggest thing that we're trying to dispel is it, it's not a Ponzi scheme. It's not about cryptocurrency. It's truly about value uh, and then the uh, immutability of that value and be able to trace back uh, through history and time, and again, as Carol was saying, you know, it's nothing. Nothing's hidden uh, uh, in in this sense. So I think so. That's first 
that's the first obstacle that we always have to get past. It's, uh, and I start there a lot of times in, in the, uh, these discussions. Uh, I very quickly get into, um, you know, talking about identity and trying to bring people into like, what is the value for you? And how do these, uh, we, you know, I've, I've spoken here uh, before, but you know, how do the collectives form and, and uh, what is that business to business paradigm that, that is about to be forming and how do trust and bridge uh, uh, trust networks and that trust and uh, uh, escrow systems, how do they all come together? These are the things that are, are typical uh, uh, the typical space where I have to start talking to then try to get to value. And, and uh, I think you kind of mentioned the commercial space where we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, it, it's starting out with celebrity and then getting down into supply chain, if that, that makes sense, Josh. So it's, it's a really interesting space to be in. Uh, and in my role at Oracle, I, I, I also cover uh, for the commercial teams, everything to do with what we used to call metaverse. Now we call immersive experience. So I get to see this this crazy world developing of like, okay, uh, there, where's there's Snoop Dogg over here. And then there's the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Marines need to get some tanks somewhere, uh, over there. So it's, it's really the, the wide gamut of that entire, uh, ecosystem. And then how those technologies sort of mesh interplay, then that gets down into some discussions. And again, I think uh, today we're, we're going to hear from some people that are in this space, uh, but you know, from the, the private ledger, uh, to public ledger type of, uh, uh, discussions come up very quickly. So these are the kinds of things that I'm talking about continually. Uh, I don't know if that helps answer your question. Like I said, I got to kind of slow down and try to really think of it's so broad right now and there's so much opportunity, but where does it really get applied? Uh, I'm going to come right back to identity. So I always start there. Thanks, Ted. Um, the that really, I think, ties the uh, the far and the wide together on this. And it, it certainly speaks to the, um, you know, the breadth of value that a system like uh, that, that it, like a structure like DLT could bring to uh, a number of people for, a, a, you know, a variety of different purposes. Um, so, uh, Mr. Cantor, I would like to, or Cantor, I would like to uh, transition over to you. I wanted to ask about oversight. Um, so one of the things that came out of the GAO report on blockchain was um, that oversighted regulatory approaches could, quote, promote safety and soundness, consumer protection and compliance with applicable laws and regulations to combat illicit activity in blockchain related commerce. Um, this also applies to financial crimes, but speaking to commerce, housing uh, and development grant, digital IDs and many other use cases, um, it, not exclusively to financial crimes. So in addition to the standards being built and security being um, being appropriately intimate, implemented, um, there needs to be a process described for audits and oversight. Uh, so in your opinion, or that of the GAO, uh, what are some of the barriers to effective oversight of blockchain solutions, either financial or non-financial? And have you seen any policy endeavors uh, since the publishing of the report back in March that you can share with us? Sure, thank you. Um, before I answer that question, let me go back uh, a little bit in the history lesson. Uh, you know, for anyone that remembers old mainframes and whatnot, mainframes used to actually have an audit function built into them. And, and anyone that still runs a mainframe actually still does. But the reason I bring this up is because when we moved away from mainframes, we started looking at distributed systems, Windows, Linux, and whatnot. And a lot of that type of working relationship with auditors I don't want to say went away, but it was no longer built into the system. Fast forward now to the blockchains, and the blockchains actually have an inherent function because of the integrity of the data that really brings back a lot of those functions for auditors. So when we're talking about understanding what a blockchain is and what it isn't at all critical levels, really we have to focus on the financial managers, the IT managers, and supply chain managers, really just to name a few of the people that are really working against or on this problem of how do you integrate this? How does it make it auditable? How do you make the integrity of the blockchain and keeping it you know, you know, in line with the necessary you know, internal controls of a system or an application? You know, so a lot of these types of things are certainly being worked on and considered you know, in, in a lot of different partnerships. Uh, there's partnerships between government and private industry. Private industry certainly is working on it. 
um, including uh, JFMIP, which is a uh, principals organization consisting of GAO, OMB, OPM, and Treasury. Um, and just kind of fast, and fast forward a little bit, we are uh, releasing a, uh, a product um, probably about summer of 2023 that really details the integration of what smart contracts were for grant, grant case usage. Uh, in the federal government, so it will be a, a an eye opener for you know how all of this this works and and how we need to really think about it, you know not only from just an integration side whether you know the system is being built from ground up, but also as you were mentioning the policy aspects, the personnel aspects, and and just you know how those payments can be auditable. Um, but you know when we when we were talking about um, you know other things you know about blockchain and auditing you know the things to really consider when we're looking at integrating these systems and and how do you make oversight is really you know as as Jennifer had spoken and as the keynote has spoken about you know these systems and applications requiring effective configuration management process really one configuration error can have a systemic effect on all the data that's in the blockchain. So it really takes an active coordination from those financial managers, from those systems and policy people when they're integrating the system to really understand what it is they're integrating and certainly hopefully no errors. Because once an error happens, it, you know, you, you can certainly see the errors and it makes it, I would say, easier to identify the errors but it doesn't actually uh, help, uh, you know, the the person that may have missed a payment or a miscalculation because, you know, after all, it's, there's there's certainly a misnomer because it's on the blockchain. It must be correct. Well, blockchains are certainly, you know, programmed by humans. So therefore, if something goes wrong with that programming, the the effect could be greater. So there, there's a couple of different things that we really need to consider as we you know, go into the auditing side of it, but also we really need to focus on you know, the, the financial managers and the internal controls when we're thinking about it from a permissioned or a private blockchain. Hey, along the uh, same line, Mr. Cantor, or Mr. Cantor, uh, apologies. Um, you know, one of the things that we also sort of saw in the, um, in the GAO report was the, the as, as you sort of alluded to there, the, um, the difference of um, the different jurisdictions having different requirements and, uh, and the ability to sort of identify who in the, um, in the process has, uh, is responsible for making, for, um, apologies, is responsible for any sort of mistakes that have come about as a result of the, the programming and whatnot. So um, what sort of challenges uh, do you see that uh, need to be addressed in order to sort of set this, uh, set a baseline at maybe even a federal level, um, considering, you know, the, the, we'll call it the decentralized um, uh, options that locality and, and the states, for example, uh, may have or may look to? Certainly, I, you know, I think, you know, in a lot of the the different uh, workings and financial statements that I've done, I think when we start looking at things of how, you know, whether interfaces be designed, blockchains are not immutable to those type of concepts. But one of the things that I've often struggled with is that we often look at the substitution of integrity of data for completeness and accuracy. And really what I mean by that is we really need to be concerned that the data that's going into the blockchain, as, as well as any financial system, is always going to be complete and accurate. Because after all, if the source document, if you entered a 100 but meant 1,000, the data will have integrity in the blockchain. It will be cryptographically signed, but you're $900 off. And so therefore, it's no longer accurate. Um, and the, the effects that could be felt along those systems. So when we think about different jurisdictional requirements and we think about you know, different policies that really need to be integrated for you know, the use of blockchains, we really are, are, are putting more emphasis on the computer programmers and the cryptographers that they really understand 
whether it be internal control, supply chain management, whatever it is that they are programming to and all the standards that those may be originally beholden to for those, whether it be jurisdictional or whatever um, areas of emphasis that the blockchain will be utilized for. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, that was really well said. And and um, I want to take just a moment and let everyone know on this call that um, one, a lot of the uh, the content that you know we sort of prepared and and wanted to make sure that we got a chance to speak with our representatives uh, who were gracious enough to join us from the GAO uh, came from that GAO blockchain report. Um, which we'll make sure that we put a link in the chat for those of you who, that, who want to do a little bit of catch up on that. Um, so Mark, one last thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, you mentioned that there was a, an upcoming report that uh, the GAO is targeting for uh, summer of this year, which I'm very excited about. Um, in the meantime, do you have any sort of documents or links, uh, you or Ms. Franks, um, from the GAO that you would recommend that we share with this uh, with this audience that we may maybe haven't done so yet. Oh, Ms. Franks dropped the link in chat. Thank you, Ms. Franks. Thank you, Jennifer. And there are so just to just to clarify for everyone, the, the upcoming report that I'm speaking of is uh, a JFMIP Joint uh, Financial Management Improvement Program. Um, and it, that's a partnership with those four collective agencies and, and we're working together really to solve the different challenges uh, for this one specifically in, in smart contracts in, uh, in, in the grant, grant payments uh, arena. But you know, one could reasonably think about you know, how that may apply to other areas as well. Um, there are, as Jennifer posted the, the one link, there are several um, blockchain reports that we have done on uh, in various areas such as taxation, um, this one for um, the financial markets, and, and there are uh, a few others. Hey, excellent, thank you. Um, so we have a few extra minutes available um, for this panel. I wanted to give all of our panelists an opportunity if they'd like to uh, say anything else or um, you know, maybe uh, readdress a question or something that happened uh, in the keynote. And um, there is a question in chat, uh, Mark, if you have an opportunity to answer. The question is, are you saying that we need a FAR review for smart contracts? Uh, unfortunately, I don't know enough about how the FAR would be applied to smart contracts to accurately answer that. Um, so I, I'm hesitant to provide any sort of question or guidance there. That's fair. Um, well, I would love to, uh, love to take this opportunity to thank our, uh, to thank our panelists, um, for being here today. Uh, Ted, uh, Jennifer, and Mark, thank you very much uh, for your time and your generosity of that time. Um, and we appreciate not only you being here, but your organizations uh, giving you the, uh, the official blessing to come here and hang out with us today. So thanks again. Um, at this point, I would love to pass it back to uh, Jackie or Fred. Fred? Um, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the panelist. Um, uh, so once again, we'll have uh, a short five minute five minutes break, and then uh, we'll kick off the panel number two. Okay. We are excited to be here with our esteemed panel this morning. So today's panel uh, will cover operationalizing blockchain throughout a few different lenses, looking at manufacturing, supply chains, stable coins, and security. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to introduce uh, each of our panelists. So today we have with us uh, Peter Mel, a senior computer scientist, uh, part of the computer security division at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, followed by David and Guyen, uh, CEO and founder of uh, United Solution. Uh, Michael Pease, a mechanical engineer at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And finally, Don Talbot, president of uh, Tevoro Corporation. Um, 
I'll be your moderator for today's panel. Uh, thank you, and uh, let's kick off. So I will start with a question um, toward uh, Peter Mel. Um, Peter, what is what do you think is the role of uh, tokens of stable coins uh, in the design of incentives to uh, maintain a sustainable blockchain network? No, thank you, Fred. <clears throat> So uh, I wrote a paper on understanding stablecoin technology and related security considerations. Uh, I work at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and so you can search for Peter Mel and stablecoin and you should get it. So my comments will reflect that. Um, so a financial platform can't succeed in supporting general commercial activities if the currency used doesn't have a stable value. Uh, so to, man <clears throat> to, to maintain a stay sustainable blockchain network, you need stable currencies. Um, stable coins provide this. Traditional cryptocurrencies by their very nature don't. So they're native cryptocurrencies linked to intrinsically to a blockchain. There are token-based cryptocurrencies that are managed by smart contracts. And again, they have no intrinsic value. They can go to zero and many do. Um, they often do maintain value because people believe they have value. Hopefully someday they'll have value because the currencies being used for legitimate business uses to a large degree, creating this sort of network effect. Um, and that is a hope for the future, but with no intrinsic value, like, like a business would have intrinsic value, the, the coin prices fluctuate dramatically. And so because of this, stable coins were introduced. Uh, and the idea is to have a token-based smart contract managed cryptocurrency maintaining value relative to some pegged asset be it a fiat currency, US dollar or gold or diamonds or oil, barrels of oil, you know, regardless of the ups and downs of the cryptocurrency market. So there's multiple ways to do this. There's holding reserve funds. Uh, there's relying on over collateralized debt positions. You got to read the paper. It's a thing. Uh, there's algorithmic price controls. Again, it's complicated. It's like two linked coins where one fluctuates in price to absorb price pressures on the stable coin. They're incredibly creative approaches for doing this. However, pretty much all of them have some commonalities, which I call the four properties. They're tokenized, they're fungible, they're tradable, they're convertible. Um, but there are 11 characteristics that I've identified that help see the, the differences between them. So they, they really vary by the number of coins between one and three coins, for example custodial type, uh, management type, their approach for automation on the blockchain, uh, when and how do they mint and burn coins, what collateral do they use, what collateralization level do they use, are they partially collateralized, fully over collateralized, what's the stabilization mechanism, um, do they depend on outside oracles, uh, can they be instantiated on multiple blockchains? Are they stuck on just one? And what's the accessibility for uh, regulatory influence on the coin? So if you take these four properties and 11 characteristics and you look at the top coins by market cap, you end up with sort of a taxonomy of architectures where there's fiat currency back, there's cryptocurrency back, there's non-currency asset back, there's the algorithmic with no collateral, there's hybrid approaches, there are private institutional approaches. Um, it is amazingly complex. When I started my research on <clears throat> writing an overview of stablecoin technology, yeah. I really thought it would be boring. I didn't think there would be much to say, and boy was I wrong. It's actually an interesting field. So, but from a transactional perspective, they all function almost identically. So as a user of stable coins, you know what? One coin's kind of like another. One US dollar linked coin is kind of like another. But in the back end, if you look at the architectures, there's very different stability, security, and trust concerns. And, and all approaches have security, stability, and trust concerns. <clears throat> you know, algorithmic pre presents special challenges, but they all have risk profiles. So sustaining a, <clears throat> creating a sustainable blockchain network will likely require stable coins. And despite their very similar appearance, it's important that that network uses the right stable coin with respect to security, stability, and trust needs because they, they simply vary greatly. 
So hopefully that answers the question, Fred, and thank you for your time. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, and um, I'm gonna open each of the question a little bit for the other panelists, if you want to add uh, to add something and uh, follow that with, can that, how can that be used within the government? Anybody wants to, uh, to follow that? Okay, um, then I'll go to the question number two. Um, how would you describe the uh, blockchain ecosystem and uh, what are some existing and new areas where you are seeing the operationalization of uh, blockchain? And this one is directed to uh, you, David. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, <clears throat> so the, the blockchain ecosystem, in my opinion, is uh, promising. You may not uh, agree with that right now, but uh, you know, last year we've seen a spectacular failure in centralized finance, uh, CFI, um, collapse of crypto exchanges, uh, but we also saw the, re the resilience of DeFi. Um, we also saw Ethereum make a major shift from proof of work um, to, uh, to proof of stake while still Bitcoin remaining on proof of work. Um, we've seen the importance of crypto uh, business models and tokenomics uh, during the crash. Um, we've also seen the rise of several uh, major notable competing layer one net networks, uh, such as Ethereum, Polygon, uh, Solana, Avalanche, uh, Cosmos, Polkadot, Harmony One, VeChain. Um, these are exciting uh, layer one uh, blockchains. And we've also seen the expansion and the use of blockchain for property, provenance, uh, supply chain, and grants. Um, within the government, uh, we did a lot of work with uh, Jose Arrieta and Mike Peckham in supply chain and, and grants. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of promise in, in combining the work that's there with, with the uh, cryptocurrency uh, market right now. Um, so where are we going? Um, even though we've seen a 90% or so drop in, in the crypto value, um, crypto companies continue to innovate behind the scenes at an incredible pace. Um, they're improving speed and scalability um, with layer two uh, options. Uh, they are, they're using ZK rollups to improve performance. Uh, uh, they're improving security in bridges. As you know, most of the hacks were in the bridges themselves, not in the blockchain. Um, they're striking a balance between privacy and, and preventing uh, bad uses of blockchain. Um, they're improving the wallets and they're increasing the interoperability. Um, we're also seeing, I think this year, we're going to see um, a, a major uh, expansion in DeFi. Um, I think we're going to see some sort of convergence in the way that we've been looking at, you know, like uh, the blockchain for government use and for uh, public use versus like the rest of the world, the financial market. Because once the financial layer is, is laid, the layer ones have been laid and it's stable and you can have the movement of money around. It's a perfect time to overlay that with smart contracts and government can come in. And, uh, you know, and Mike Peckham and I, um, when we did work with the government, we talked about the vision of having the grants blockchain run on top of some payment rails. Um, uh, digitizing the whole experience so that we can track um, the movement of money from the recipient to the sub-recipients and then to its intended purpose. Um, so lots of, lots of movement, I think, in that area will happen. Whether or not the government will do it is another story. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, promise in metaverses. I think that's an easy area to adopt. Um, and um, if we get crypto legislation this year, it's gonna fuel a ton of crypto investments. And I really hope that we do. And, and lastly, to Peter's point, um, you can't do it without stable coins. So I think there are a lot of uh, regulations uh, proposed for stable coins. I think they're pretty, they're pretty obvious. Um, and we need that because without stable coins without liquidity, it's really diff uh, difficult to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um... So earlier I talked about the uh, the blockchain playbook and the second phase is re related to um, the organization readiness. Uh, from your experience, how important is the readiness of organizations when it comes to adopting blockchain-based solutions? Uh, Fred, this is a yeah. question. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a follow-up to, uh, to you or anybody. Oh, else. sure. Yeah, so um, in implementing blockchain, we, uh, you know, we, we confronted so many issues. 
Um, I think foundationally, blockchain is not just a technology, it's a business model transformation. And I think that's why the government has a diff difficult time embracing that concept. So when we went in, um, you know, we tried to implement the blockchain, we had to diffuse that concern um, and we had concerns about security. So what we did was we built a single node blockchain, which isn't ideal um, because we thought, hey, if we can at least do the simple use case and we can prove that it can work. Uh, and we focused on the non-invasive area, which was providence and, and property um, and attestations. Uh, we thought that we can, we can get through it. But unless I think the government um, or any organization adopting blockchain understands the profound implications to the business model by removing the intermediaries, um, it's really hard to fulfill the true promise of it. And what you start to see is the argument against blockchain, which is it's just like any ordinary database. Um, and it, to some extent, it is like a database. But when you look at the business model, that's really where the transformation happens. It's a way to connect and rewire the business and connect it to an ecosystem that has not, uh, that it couldn't uh, before. Um, so I, I would say that's one of the first things. Um, I think in order to fulfill the full vision of blockchain, we really need legislation. We have no choice um, because the value that you gain from blockchain is driven by the finance and the economics. And if you can't bring crypto into it and you can't merge smart contracts with the crypto and economics, how will you justify the business value of implementing a radical transformation as, as blockchain? And until the regulations make it safer for people, people to put money into um, the crypto market, you'll have small investments. You, know, um, you, you may have few firms with multi-billion dollar investments, but many will generally be small. Once you get that legislation in place, where it's safer to do that, I think we're going to see an explosion. So back to you. Thank you. Uh, Michael, in terms of blockchain's development, uh, what are some examples, uh, use cases that uh, are making good use of blockchain? And then what should organizations consider when moving toward operationalization of it? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and I might be bringing a slightly different uh, use case perspective. Um, in my research, we've been finding that blockchains and distributed ledger technology are very flexible and can provide several key capabilities, such as immutable records, uh, decentralized information sharing, and non-repudiation. And these capabilities can be leveraged for supporting for organizations to support use cases around supply chain management, including product traceability, provenance, authenticity, and supply chain dependencies. I was recently part of a team that engaged in a multidisciplinary community of interest um, research effort to gather the current needs and perspectives from industry on the use of blockchains and related technologies to support you know, uh, supply chain manufacturing, uh, supply chain traceability. Uh, we published a white paper, it's um, NIST IR 8419, summarizes this information and goes into detail about multiple projects that industry shared with us and some of their lessons learned and some of the, the issues and uh, uh, opportunities that they identified for, for the implementation. For example, one of the projects was a manufacturer that was encountering um, a number of uh, growing issue where they were receiving non-genuine and non-compliant parts that they were then using to support their automotive and consumer electronic customers. And so these parts were causing like a negative impact on their business and brand. So they implemented a secure traceability solution to address the problem and used blockchains to create uh, provenance record data with the uh, with their supply chains, uh, with their supply chain vendors to address the problem. Um, another one was a, a metal ledger project uh, that was conducted in response to an FDA request. Uh, for addressing the requirements in the Drug Supply Chain Security Act. And for that effort, the, the compliance meant having package level traceability and interoperability among multiple ecosystems to enable tracing. Um, it was a very comprehensive report that was published by Medjugorje and is referenced in our, in our 8419 report. Uh, utilizing these blockchains to support supply chain traceability it's like you've, like we've been hearing, there's uh, a lot of different ways that blockchains can be used to support our economy. This is just yet another one. It's a little difficult to just summarize what organizations need to consider when moving toward blockchains. Um, like we were talking about, there's technical and non-technical challenges. So 
you know, whether it's federated identities or determining what transactions will be stored in the blockchain and um, what architecture they're going to be using. I think one of the things that organizations will probably need to address is data. And data is a key aspect in these, in these efforts. But an important point is that not all data can or should be stored in the blockchain. So organizations will need to provide sufficient information to allow use cases such as authenticity and compliance to be determined, but also have to take into consideration data privacy and confidentiality requirements. Another data challenge is that different ecosystems may require different minimum data requirements for the blockchain. And organizations that are participating in multiple ecosystems may have to adjust to make sure they're providing the required data uh, to, to participate in these different environments. Um, another important aspect um, that impacts the supply chain traceability is the ability to link physical objects with digital records. This is um, uh, sometimes referred to as cyber physical an uh, anchors. Um, and so this is another aspect that organizations may need to address. They may either need to produce or create processes to access the embedded tags um, or to create the, uh, the embedded tags as part of their processes or both. Um, and the degree to which ecosystems can establish these unique or unclonable cyber physical anchors may vary. Um, for example, uh, we can probably place cyber physical an anchors on a computer chip, but you know, how do we create similar type of anchors on like produce or bulk items? Uh, so the data and cyber physical an anchors are examples of just a few of those challenges that we identified and documented in our report. Um, but those are probably some of the things that organizations need to need to take a look at or consider as they're looking to operationalize the use of uh, blockchains. Overall, I believe that um, these use cases uh, for supporting provenance and traceability and um, yeah, the technical and non-technical challenges, these are just, you know, these are like the uh, stepping stones um, that, you know, that we'll, that we'll need to work through uh, but blockchains have enormous potential, and I'm looking forward to doing a lot more research in this area. Thank you. Are there some next steps uh, for the, the COI research that, uh, that you were part of? Yes, yes. Building on the um, IR8419 that we did, um, we recently started an effort with the National Cybersecurity Center for Excellence to research a proof of concept uh, supply chain traceability solution using blockchains. Uh, we're planning to establish um, or essentially simulate a multi-ecosystem uh, supply chain uh, solution that will involve like a, essentially a chip manufacturing facility, a software development integration ecosystem, and uh, a critical infrastructure sector end user to assess the challenges and issues that organizations may face when both uh, joining and participating in these ecosystems and how you know, leveraging the blockchain information can be uh, utilized by you know, critical sector, critical infrastructure sector or other users to um, validate their products and determine authenticity and provenance. Uh, so the project has just started. So unfortunately we don't have anything published yet, but we're hoping to have a site on the NCCOE web server shortly. Uh, and we'll be requesting uh, community, community of interest participation in helping us refine our project description and possibly also looking for partners to assist with the implementation. But there will definitely be more details coming out on the NCCOE site uh, in the near future. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Don, um, do you see specific factors that should not be neglected in the blockchain ecosystem? Hi. Uh, yes, um, I have worked in a couple of different areas um, over the course of the last 10 years. I've, I'm running this company now and I've worked in the financial industry for most of my career in several different roles. Um, but I also have worked uh, facilitating design sessions for people who are planning blockchains and really getting down um, into the, the nuts and bolts of the engineering um, and also the, uh, 
the design sprints and sessions that you need in order to implement these things. So for me, the most common issue I see when I'm hosting a design session or helping people plan one of these is they have conflated their design objectives. Um, I think it's uh, the some are, is this community trying to transform the monetary system, decentralize finance, decentralize data storage, create behavioral incentives, make industries more secure. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And it often uh, confuses the designers themselves. So um, there are a vast number of conflated objectives in the industry right now. And iron ironically, they have trouble reaching consensus. <laughs> so um, ultimately, uh, I think that this industry has to, has to collectively work to gain the trust of their consumers. And it re requires perhaps a better design methodology. So that's really where I've focused um, is cr I, I am upset by the piecemeal automation that's been going on, particularly in financial applications in blockchain. Um, I think that it's, it's easy to pick off the low lying fruit and somehow miss the system dynamics that dictate the behavior at an aggregate level. So that's really where I'm honed in on. And um, uh, I co-authored a book on this topic and, and it really gets into the concept of governance and how to enhance the design uh, process to include um, something a little more sophisticated in a way, a little more technical. Um, you can still sketch it on the back of a napkin, but um, what we're trying to do is take into consideration in, a, in an organization like this, the government is very interested, as Carol mentioned, in going after you know, illicit finance and consumer exploitation. When, when the financial community talks about self-governance, they are focused on something different. They're focused on the quality of the product they produce. So if we're sitting here talking about Web 3.0, and how we are going to, to decentralize data and shift the focus um, or the power base away from aggregating all the uh, data, I think it's also important to think about shifting the focus of um, behavioral, well, sort of monitoring these systems, not targeting the customer, but, cus but targeting the product. So if that makes sense to you, um, that's what we're working on. Um, so for decades, uh, you know, consensus was already included in the financial industry. Um, it, and so we're working to bring something into existence that allows you to capture the fact that um, self-governance can be applicable to both man and machine, because ultimately, if you look at the participants in these systems, they utilize bundles of algorithms, that, um, whether it's a bot using them or a person using them, um, that's what we're managing. And if you take a step back in abstraction and start to look at these as behavioral classifications, you come up with a better way to govern a financial system. So we're really doing behavioral classifications and we did a case study on an exchange, a, um, and we're working really hard to get the methodology and the case study out to people as quickly as possible so that they can maybe, you know, take it and run with it. Um, but the core of it is coming up with, um, it's called a combinatorial optimization uh, standard. Um, and what that allows you to do is come up with something called an incident. And I know that sounds a little bit geeky and mathematical, but an incidence matrix is very familiar to any computer scientist. And what it allows you to do is hand that to a legislator or a regulator or a board of director member and say, here are the ways that we have promoted consensus, cooperation, and put up guardrails against collusion. This is our self-governance mechanism. And if changes are made here, here, or here, you can see the other places where unintended consequences may occur. I think this will really help enhance transparency in these exchanges and help give consumers more confidence. I think it gives legislators and, and uh, regulators a, a roadmap and I think it helps in just corporate oversight. So that's just one area. That's one area where I'm kind of focused, um, but there are other areas. I, I think that there's a lot of work that still can be done on smart contracts. We all know that, you know, 
dynamic exception handling isn't something blockchain handles very well. So um, I follow projects like Obsidian to make sure that there are, um, you know, more sophisticated, perhaps contract languages coming into existence and how those, how those uh, emerge over time. I think that one came out of Carnegie Mellon. Um, but yeah, there are, there are definitely, um, there are definitely pieces of this that I think can become more sophisticated um, it, from design all the way through to implementation. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, so how, how do you see then the blockchain evolve uh, with, uh, with uh, what was talked about uh, when it comes to operationalizing the technology? When it comes to, uh, sorry, that- oh, Operationalizing the technology? Yes, I, I think that, um, the, the, where we're headed, if you look at the speed at which AI is now being launched and embraced, um, I think that we are going to end up having more autonomous systems being operated by artificial means. And I think that the beauty of this kind of approach to creating behavioral structures and, and segmenting um, algorithms, whether they're human or computerized, um, you end up finding a way that those two can converge operationally and still remain auditable um, and still provide some level of confidence to the, to the people who actually utilize them. So um, right now, if you look at the, if you look at finance, um, they're evolving due to a shift in the perceived benefits of capitalism, public faith in human oversight, um, pieces that were always handled within one corporation are being splintered off. Um, we've got even, you know, tokens, money uh, are being created by traditional sort of quasi banking structures and just regular companies. These are all being unbound and being recombined in new ways. So I think that having an oversight structure or self-governance structure that allows you to monitor for collusion and cooperation is probably the best way to solve this. I'm not smart enough to come up with all of the answers to this. And I listen to my co-panelists here who have all kinds of um, ideas on how to segregate it, how to, how to analyze it. The beauty of the old financial system, and it was not, you know, we know it's not perfect, but one of the pieces that was beautiful about it is that the self-governance mechanism when you put it together in a mathematical formula is fractal. It can be replicated. It welcomes as many participants into the system as, as you would like. And it means that anyone with a new idea can enter the system, propose their method and compete to see if they have a better track record at producing results. And that I think is an intriguing concept. It's an intriguing way to go about um, building these things because trying to get the entire solution before you, before you launch a market kind of defeats the purpose of the market. You, you're supposed to have competition there. So that's really, I think, a better way to um, create ecosystems and allow these things to evolve more organically um, and make them very inclusive. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're getting to the end of our panel, but I wanted to uh, give uh, all the panelists uh, a couple of minutes if you had uh, any, any closing statement or thing that you wanted to, uh, to add. Uh, we have about two minutes. I'd just like to add one thing, and that is that um, I think that we have, for the last couple, like decade or so, I'm pretty old. So for the last decade or so, we have had um, very highly specialized job functions and educational majors. Um, and I think that blockchain is forcing us to maybe think of whether it's time for a new renaissance era, we need to be able to cross over some of these disciplines. And when you put together a blockchain operation, you really have to start thinking, we can't just keep picking off automating the low hanging fruit. We have to do something bigger and creating create systems that behave ethically. And that's really where I think we need to focus. Anybody else? Uh, Fred, thank you for putting this panel together. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for listening, all, all those that are out there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Yes, thank you.
there are some questions in the chat. Um, maybe I mean toward the end or during the during the breaks, we can uh, we can have discussions around the question in the chat. Uh, but so here we're going to conclude uh, this panel. Thank you so much, uh, panelists. And uh, we're going to have, I think, if I read that correctly, a five minute break, and then we'll start. Uh, we'll engage to the use case uh, overviews. Um, so, yep, see you in a few minutes. Thank you so much. And Thank don't you. hesitate to engage during the break. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's see, so now, uh, we will now begin our use case uh, presentations. So to kick us off, I would like to introduce uh, Tammy Johnson, uh, Management and Program Analyst at the Bureau of uh, the Fiscal Service, Department of Treasury, and Mike Moore, uh, also uh, Management and Program Analyst at the Bureau of Fiscal Service, Department of Treasury. Thank you. Thanks for having us today. So, uh, we appreciate that and uh, you allowing us to join. So again, I'm Mike Moore. Tammy Johnson and I will be sharing the Bureau of the Fiscal Services exploration of blockchain. So within Fiscal Service, we work for the Office of Financial Innovation and Transformation, or FIT. And FIT supports financial management transformation initiatives that emphasize the use of new and emerging capabilities. And we're excited to share our story with you today. And we can go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, so we've only have about 15 minutes with you today and then we'll have some time for question and answers. So I'll begin with an overview of our journey. And so our office has incrementally increased our learning with blockchain by doing a series of projects, learning from each and improving in the next phase. So we've broken this into uh, three phases here. And our first journey uh, was a few years ago with an internal project that improved our physical asset tracking uh, using distributed ledger technology. And so we were able to track cell phones with uh, out the manual process of like barcode scanning inventory and having people bring them into the office because we knew that the user had access to the phone via their credentials and we could track if the phone was in use and we knew who it belonged to. So this gave our organization exposure to blockchain technology and allowed us to learn. So while we're not currently in production with this use case, we learned a lot of lessons and uh, we had just implemented a new asset tracking system. And so this would be something that we would wanna revisit if we were to uh, implement a new system in the future. And so we did find it promising. Uh, but the biggest win we got from this first use case was bringing the term blockchain into the organization and doing education and getting past the hurdle of people thinking that it is only cryptocurrency. And that allowed us to move into the next phase where we explored another uh, tracking use case, use case, which is uh, understanding if we could use blockchain to manage software licenses to track which employees were still actively using the licenses and which ones could be restocked. And uh, we saw, you know, we wanted to see if we could expand this, but what happened is we ran into problems that didn't have to do with the technology, had to do with how vendors treat government agencies in their licenses. So they see us as separate entities and we didn't see uh, room for expansion here to further pursue this use case. However, again, we got to learn more about the technology, which we were able to put into another use case, which was on grant payments. And so that's where uh, we partnered with the National Science Foundation, or NSF, uh, to use blockchain technology to tokenize, mm -hmm. transfer, and redeem a payment. And that's our current use case, and we'll dig into that a little more on the next slide. And so one of the reasons that we explored the grants uh, use case is because of well-known pain points in the process. So each year, various federal entities uh, send out billions of dollars in grants and recipients often use the money to distribute their own grants to smaller subgrantees. Uh, this money must be tracked as it passes through each organization. 
And a lot of time is spent uh, reporting and doing paperwork uh, for the grant recipients. And so there's a lack of transparency after the funding goes to the prime recipient. And there's burdensome reporting that's involved for all parties in the process. And so we wanted to see if we could improve this process. And um, you know, something else that happens here that we wanna make sure we point out is that in the grant process, if you have a, uh, a researcher that's doing burdensome reporting, it takes away from the time when the actual uh, research that they're doing for the purpose of the grant. So, you know, someone in layman's terms could be working to cure a disease and yet they're spending time on burdensome reporting. You know, in our opinion, if we can reduce that burden and increase the transparency, it's a win-win for all parties involved. So this project uh, essentially turns grant payments into digital tokens that represent actual money. The recipients can either redeem the token with government agencies for cash or divide it up and distribute it to the sub grantees uh, who could do the same. And so, you know, again, the lack of transparency and the, uh, the burden of reporting are two of the key categories that led us to uh, this use case. And rather than have me talk about it, uh, if you could pull up the video on the next slide, uh, we created something that's a, a little more exciting and then listen to me talk. So I'll pause here for a second if you're able to play that for us. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully you found that intriguing and piqued your interest. Uh, so today we're gonna walk through an example. Um, we think it's helpful to see a demonstration rather than us uh, just talking about it. And so we built what we call a clickable prototype to demonstrate how blockchain would function. And this is available to you as well. So you'll see on the screen the, uh, the link and the password. Um, this prototype demonstrates how federal agencies can convert a grant award into a, a digital asset with programmable properties and business rules uh, for the transfer and redemption of the award. And this is all digitally tracked. And so I want to note first uh, that this is referred to as our MVP or minimally viable product. So not all the features are included since it's not in production and we're proving out uh, the technology and the use case first. So I'm going to walk you through this and take over screen control for just a second here. And while Mike's doing this, the, what we're showing here is the user interface um, that we've developed for the MVP. And then behind it, the transactions are being posted to the blockchain and also to an external database because we're not keeping all the um, data elements on the blockchain because we were thinking about the long-term performance of it. Um, once the educational document for JFMIP is issued, we'll have a video that shows the connection between this user interface blockchain and the external um, database that we're using. Yeah. Thank you, Tammy. Again, this is available to you, for you to click through. I'm gonna give you a short demo. I won't be able to do the full demo today uh, based on time, um, but we'll get started here as logging in as a grant officer. So here the NSF grant officer would log into our application, which is uh, web-based. And what we're 
just to kind of orient you here, uh, again, I'm logged in as the grant officer and the summary uh, tab is available. We have grants uh, tab that would show all the grants, but right now we're gonna show the feature of creating a new one. Um, and we would input all the data elements and with the magic of a click of a button for the demo, we'll fill this in, go ahead and create a, a grant with all the data elements uh, that are listed here. Again, there would probably be others, but this is a, a minimally viable product. All right, so that grant was created and you can see here in our grant su summary um, that that was created and all the data elements that we filled out are available uh, for us to see. You could uh, view the history and we are going to move on to the prime recipient, uh, which is the College of Charleston that we prepared this for. All right, we will sign in going quickly for demo purposes uh, and we're gonna look at the grants. Um, here's the one that was created. So I'm gonna click on that so you can see the summary. And here's a feature that we wanted to know that you could build in some smart features. So internal controls can be added. And so what I'm going to do is click on the add controls and put in a maximum reimbursement amount. This would have to be approved if it goes over. And so you can see here that we put that in and turned on the controls. And, and this is a, a great feature that can, again, everything that's changed could be uh, digitally tracked. And we could update this so that it can be auto redeemed. So if, if it's under that uh, threshold, it can go ahead and be uh, redeemed and go through the ACH process. So I'll confirm that option. And I'm gonna pause here, something I wanted to mention on the right-hand side, this, uh, pro uh, this clickable prototype walks through the journey. So you can see that we've created uh, the grant, which uh, created a token, and then we can go through uh, changing the options and doing a drawdown all the way to uh, approving and uh, then reporting on that grant. Uh, with all the information that's in the background, we're able to reduce that burdensome reporting because all the information is held in, uh, in one location. And so what I'll do here is walk through quickly uh, selecting the grants and um, this is creating a reimbursement request. So um, in order to, we'll fill this in for demo purposes. And I wanna show you that this becomes available in the wallet. And so you can see this here that we've created that reimbursement request and uh, it's available in the wallet. So uh, in order to redeem. So I'm gonna pause there cause I wanna allow us uh, some time for the for the rest, but you guys can click through this on your own. Uh, and also, as Tim mentioned, we have some other videos we'll be putting out that helps connect our application here that I just showed to where the information is being stored on the blockchain as well as our external database. And so we're preparing that uh, and should be available by this summer. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll allow uh, you to start sh sharing again. you can move it to the next um, slide. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tammy, who's gonna talk about uh, accounting and financial impact. Thanks, Mike. Um, we do encourage you to look at the clickable prototype and think about you know, uh, comments that you may have, but do keep in mind that it is minimally viable. So we know there's more functionality to be built out um, in order for it to go further in the um, research process, process. So as part of the work that we did, we really wanted to look at how blockchain would impact accounting and financial management. So one of the things that you know people were kind of struggling with was, well, how does blockchain work? And we thought it was really important to share kind of our view on how blockchain works. You know, currently we use a double entry accounting process. So agency A has its own general ledger, agency B has its own general ledger. And, you know, right now you can see that these transactions are in sync, but sometimes our general ledgers get out of sync. 
uh, you know, maybe the agency A doesn't post a transaction in the same period that agency B does, or maybe they post different dollar amounts. And so that's where the reconciliation issues come in. And there's quite frequently reconciliations and the um, issues in the grant process. And sometimes those can take a really long time to figure out, you know, what is correct. And they spend a lot of time. So that administrative time that, that Mike talked about. And so we're trying to see like, you know, can blockchain solve that? And we believe it can because it uses what we call a triple entry accounting uh, distributed ledger. So you have the agency A and agency B, you can see the impacts on those transactions. But the, what the blockchain provides is a consensus. Everybody's agreeing to this transaction and that that is the correct transaction and everybody's using that for the reporting and so forth. So that should eliminate or minimize the number of reconciliations. There still could be mistakes if someone puts in a wrong amount, but for the most part, it should eliminate the reconciliation issues. And we think that's an important feature. And we like to show this um, because as other speakers have mentioned, you know, blockchain really brings into having that multidiscipline, um, really looking at the technology, what it does, what's the impact on accounting, auditing, and so forth. So we really need to look at it from all aspects. And, and really, as we've been working through these projects, we've brought people in from those different areas. And this was something that really resonated with the accounting folks that we've been dealing with, you know, how this actually works and is more efficient. So if we can move to the next slide. I wanted to just talk about what we envision the impact will be on federal financial management. And it really boils down to four areas. You know, that general ledger accounting that I just talked about, really driving that efficiency across the processes, automating things like the internal controls, having those tie points for the transactions. Everybody, you know, books being in sync because we're agreeing to those transactions and they're validated on the blockchain and people have access to their copies of the ledger, which would have the same information. The second is really that reporting. So we have the, that validated source of information and we're able to pull from that. And we're all pulling from that same source of data. So our records are in sync and we should be able to pull it and we should have access it, to it much quicker. So Mike had mentioned the um, reporting that's required for the subrecipient. And that happens much, a long time after those subre um, grants are issued. And by having this information on the blockchain, um, those that, that should have access to particular grants will have access to that information and have it in real time. And they'll be able to see all those transactions related to individual grants, and then they'll be able to boil or have information on all the grantees that they've awarded to, et cetera. So that reporting should be much more efficient. The third is really, what does that do to our workforce? And you know, people sometimes think about new technology and they think, oh, that's gonna make me lose my job. It's really not. What it's gonna allow our accounting workforce to do is focus on advising. What is this data really telling us? How can we use it to make better business decisions rather than spending all this time on reconciliations? And so we see that that it will be a great benefit to um, agencies. And, and really, if there are use cases like this for private sector, you know, where they're having access to that data sooner and being able to use it to make those business decisions. And the last is really auditing shifting the auditors from record tracing and verification to really doing more complex analysis, thinking about like, do they see any trends that could, could um, indicate fraud, um, doing some predictive audits on, you know, what, what's going to happen if the numbers change in such a way, or, um, you know, what's going to be the impact on these things. So when we think about it, blockchain really can have a huge financial um, a huge impact on financial management. It's going to take time because as a, the speakers that have talked to us before, there's still a lot of things that we need to figure out, but it's got the potential and we're very excited for the future. We could go to the next slide. Um, we will take questions, but I did want to mention that we're going to do a drop-in session 
if you're interested in continuing the conversation on our use case. And if you are, that's our email address. Um, please just put in there that you're interested in the drop-in session um, for blockchain. Um, and we'll send you the invite and the login information, and you can join at any time. If you can't make it at one o'clock, uh, but you can make it at 115, we'd love to have you and um, we can continue this conversation. So we're really looking to, forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Tammy and Mike. So we have a couple of minutes uh, for, for questions. Um, I see a question here on the chat. How does the recipient access the money in the wallet? Is it just a journal entry in the wallet? So they would do the transaction um, and then it does um, impact the wallet posted on the blockchain and then also the external database. Um, so it, it's all connected um, and they can see the, the transactions and then when they um, that's to transfer the tokens. And then when they actually do the ACH payment, the request for the ACH payment, we uh, connect into the financials or would connect into the financial system and actually make the payments through the ACH rails. And then there would be a confirmation of that on the blockchain. So you can see it all the way through clear through payments, you know, once all those connections are made. Right now, we haven't made any of those connections because we're still in a um, test environment. And, and what is the underlying blockchain technology that is used for the prototype? So for the prototype, we're using Kaleido, which is a managed service um, for testing purposes. Some of the, um, we haven't made uh, decisions on what, what would happen if this goes to a pilot. Um, some of the decisions that we made were um, when you're testing new technology and trying to see if something's gonna work, you make some decisions on you know, um, speed, uh, cost and, um, you know, testing the functionality. And if, if you're going to fail, um, not that we went in this thinking we would fail, but, you know, you don't want to spend a large amount of money um, when you're testing things. And so we made some of those decisions on the components that we used on the basis of what could we take, um, do quickly to test this. Um, but those decisions would need to be made before someone would take it to a pilot on what would be those um, components. Thank you again so much, uh, Tammy and Mike, uh, for a great presentation. Um, now, uh, I'm going to move to the presentation number two, and I would like to introduce our second use case presenter, uh, Greg uh, Meredith, uh, founder of our chain cooperative. Greg, you can take it over. Hello. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to th thank um, uh, the working group for inviting me today. Um, and I also wanted to uh, give a shout out to Ralph Banco uh, for connecting me with uh, uh, Josh. Um, and uh, I really appreciated all the uh, uh, talks by the panelists and presenters so far. It's been quite a stimulating morning. Um, uh, so uh, with, with that, let me let me dive uh, straight in. Uh, you're seeing the debut of a of a, a, a startup stealth or a, uh, yeah a startup in stealth, and that is a Firefly.io. Um, uh, Firefly is picking up where Archain left off, um, and this is a bit of a, a, a an Archain retrospective. Uh, so if we could uh, go to the next slide. Um, so, so the organization of the talk is, is pretty straightforward. I want to I want to talk about what I see the real value of blockchain as, uh, and I think it's going to be fairly different from the perspectives that we heard uh, earlier this morning. I'm going to talk about um, how the uh, the row architecture, so the reflective higher order architecture, uh, fulfills this value proposition. Um, um, I'll say a little bit about um, uh, what happened uh, to Archain Cooperative. And how that uh, how that needs to inform um, government policy as well as the the private public sector interface, and then uh, and and then talk a little bit about um, a flaw that exists in all the digital token models to date um, that sort of supports um, the proposals that I'm making about where the real value is. Um, so hopefully uh, hopefully this makes sense. 
So if we could move on to the next slide. Um, so from my perspective, the real value of blockchain is fault tolerance. When I began looking at the, the, um, the Bitcoin consensus protocols, um, uh, you know, what I, what I saw was a protocol where, you know, if Russian gangsters or the Chinese government or even the U.S. government took down nodes in the Bitcoin network, a thousand other nodes could, in principle, take their place somewhere else on Earth. Um, and this is not just for human attacks. Um, uh, it, it's also true when we are thinking about um, the kind of stress that the um, climate change related challenges are going to uh, put on our global digital infrastructure. Uh, and, and so having this kind of fault tolerance uh, on the global uh, digital uh, infrastructure is important, I think, uh, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you have um, what's going to happen uh, <laughs> uh, to data centers uh, as temperatures rise, um, as uh, floods happen, and as fires happen uh, more and more frequently, and as conflicts arise as a result of uh, people needing to um, uh, uh, relocate en masse uh, to different uh, geographic regions. This is going to put a, a massive stress on our global digital infrastructure. And so I see that uh, decentralization, one of the key values of, of uh, uh, decentralization with respect to the global digital infrastructure, uh, it's key to securing our supply chain. Uh, so that that's, that's how I think about um, the, the sort of overall value of the blockchain. Uh, if we can move on to the, the next slide. Um, so how does the row architecture fulfill this, this value proposition of um, uh, uh, a resilient uh, global digital infrastructure? So the, the first thing is that, that we need to understand how to scale. Um, and, um, and this comes from a very simple observation, which is that most transactions are isolated. So just imagine, if you will, for a moment, you know, Alice is in Santiago, Chile, and Bob is in Beijing, China. And, and at the same time, they're purchasing, you know, either empanadas, mm -hmm. grilled tofu from uh, street vendors. So, so the likelihood uh, that those transactions touch the same resources, even the same banks, um, uh, is zero. Um, and most of these isolated transactions run independently on today's infrastructure. That's how today's infrastructure actually scales. Um, and, and so what we, what we discover is that to get to scale is not about some magical consensus algorithm. It's actually about concurrency. Uh, and so our chain is built on uh, the best model of concurrent computing that has been developed to date. And if uh, if time permits, I'll, I'll go into some of the details of that. I've say I've saved dessert for the for the end. Um, uh, but 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 just just to give you an idea of how uh, our chain uh, the row architecture scales. Um, when we launched uh, Testnet Zero, the the flagship application was storing audio data on chain. Uh, and delivering it, playing it directly from a Google or Apple Play player um, in real time. And in summer of 2022, we demonstrated storing video data on chain and delivering it back from chain in real time. So you can watch the videos of us doing this. Um, uh, of course, if you're, uh, an IPFS doesn't work, uh, as as a, an alternative, um, and the reason is because it's not about just putting data in some location. You have to be able to find it again. So our chains, uh, so you have you, you need a query model. <laughs> so our chain smart contracting model is not just for programming uh, the chain; uh, it's also a transactional query language. Uh, so so um, just to put this in context, right? Internet search is what created the global economy. When ordinary people, not the captains of industry, when ordinary people could 24 seven from their mobile or personal device, 
um, go and find, you know, jobs, reviews, product services, uh, analysis, news. Um, uh, that's what created the global economy. And the current uh, proposed blockchain architectures that like take uh, OpenSea's architecture for their NFTs. Um, uh, so they, they, they're storing the digital data on IPFS, which is not searchable, behind an unsearchable blockchain, Ethereum. And so the first, like, like once we could show that we could, you know, store all kinds of assets on chain, um, a bunch of artists came to us to talk about some NFT solutions. And the, like when we talked to them, you know, their feedback about OpenSea and, and other NFT platforms was, well, I put my stuff up there. Now, how do people find my stuff? Right. And the way that's done today is, is people launch a social media campaign, a blitz campaign to try to, 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 you know, tell the world that their stuff is landing on OpenSea or, or whatever platform, Rarible. Um, but, uh, but that, that falls off the horizon in about five minutes. You have to be able to search. And so if you want the chain to actually be valuable, uh, you need a transactional query language on top of the chain. Uh, next slide. Um, so, so what happened to our chain cooperative? So, uh, and, and this, this is really a cautionary tale. Uh, it's meant to be a little bit scary. Uh, you know, everybody likes Stephen King. Um, so, so our chain, uh, uh, in towards the tail end of, uh, last summer was negotiating a $25 million, uh, private equity deal with Jim Capital. Uh, and at the same time, Smith's News, UK's largest news distributor, had uh, chosen our chain to replace IBM SAP as their supply chain inventory solution. Um, a small contingent of Chinese token holders decided that they did not want our chain to have independent sources of revenue apart from token sales. And so they colluded on social media. We have screenshots of, uh, of their communications on WeChat and QQ. And they collaborated to do an illegal bear raid to drive the token to less than a cent, which then in turn tanked the private equity deal, which then killed the work for Smith's News. Uh, had this illegal bear raid been conducted on a uh, regulated market, like say uh, the New York Stock Exchange, the, um, the perpetrators would have been in front of a federal judge faster than you can say lickety split. But because the uh, crypto exchanges are unregulated, there was literally no legal recourse. And guess what? Amazingly, there are five groups working to commercialize um, the row technology, and most of them are Chinese. Imagine that. What, an, what a surprise. Um, and more generally, one needs to ask what major uh, layer one blockchains are actually domiciled in the US. I mean, certainly Ethereum is not, um, you know, is Cosmos, you know, none of them are. None of the major ones are actually domiciled in the US. Um, and, and from my point of view, this uh, is a matter of national security. This is a, uh, a groundbreaking technology. It's a pivotal technology uh, for increasing, you know, Homo sapiens superpower, uh, uh, which is coordination, right? So this takes our ability to coordinate up a level uh, and uh, and so it it behooves the U.S. to lay out a regulatory framework that is going to attract uh, these major technological innovators to domicile in the U.S., where they can then be uh, uh, you know uh, watched over <laughs> by regulators, <laughs> where they can have a decent dialogue, uh, not just with the market. Uh, but with the government. Next slide, please. Layer blockchain. What the fuck is that? Um, so, uh, so I, I would like to sort of point out uh, a flaw in every digital token model proposed to date, including our chains. We we were we were hypnotized uh, by the same uh, same misconceptions. Um, so suppose a blockchain network sells a digital token at a fixed price and uh, the purchaser just holds the token, never using it or trading it. 
passing it on to their heirs who pass it on to their heirs, et cetera. Right? So the, the token is just sitting there in a wallet, like say uh, Satoshi's tokens or just sitting there in a wallet forever. So if the network never collects transaction fees, right? But the electricity required to keep that token serviceable is still burning. So think about that. Eventually the cost of the electricity, the power necessary to service those tokens, so should someone ever decide to trade them is going to overrun the compensation collected for the token. So that has very specific consequences to financial models, reasonable financial models for the tokens. And it gets worse for utility tokens like ETH or our chains rev. Um, those tokens, when they are sold, actually correspond to a debt on the books, right? The network has, has uh, um, uh, 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 you know, something in the red side of the ledger, which is the compute resources, the network compute resources that are promised uh, th that the token holder can redeem for, right? So that's either the ability to run smart contracts or the ability to store data on the network. But these resources are consuming electricity until the tokens are redeemed. So the takeaway here is that Digital tokens are perishable goods like apples or milk. And there is no way to avoid this. In fact, you can predict if you, if you get your differential equations right, including this fact, you can predict the boom and bust cycles uh, in the market that have to do with the fact that all the network providers can't pay their electricity bills with their tokens. So even if they are collecting transaction fees, they must exit their token holdings to go and pay their electricity bills. So you can actually, you can, you can get models that predict the boom and bust cycles. Um, all right, so next slide. Um, so there are, Plenty of fixes, right? We've had successful economic models for perishable goods for a very long time. Uh, futures and options. So I mean, that's a that's a, a bog standard model uh, or bog standard financial instrument for dealing with um, perishable entities. There's a rental model. So token holders must use what they've got uh, for running smart contracts or trading or whatever electronic value they're getting out of it within a window of time or pay to extend their lifetime or lose them. Uh, so it's, it's, it's even worse than phone minutes, right? Um, because, you know, you can, uh, the, the telephony networks uh, know that, 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 that people on average are going to use up their phone minutes right away because there's such a demand for communication um, uh, rather than the, the mindset of token holders, which is holdable. Um, uh, so, 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 a rental model is, is something that uh, that could be explored. And then there's advertising. So token holders, as long as they're holding tokens could become the target of sponsored content. And then pushing sponsored content is bringing revenue back into the, the network. So these are all um, possible fixes uh, that need to be explored. Uh, but as it stands now, the existing token models are all broken. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, if there is appetite, I, uh, I let me gauge from the audience. We can go dive into what makes the row architecture so cool. I think we have enough time for that. Uh, is there an entry? We have, um, yeah, we have. Sorry, we have about uh, three minutes or so for for questions. If okay, there is then anybody I'll just, I'll would just, like to, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll just leave it there then. Oh, it works. But. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, any questions for it? How does it work? <laughs> uh, does our chain uh, use classical consensus? 
No, our, our chain used a um, a variant of Casper that we had running a full two years before Ethereum did its merge. Uh, I, I worked with Vitalik and Vlad Zamfir to develop Casper. Yeah, Cas Casper, uh, without some modifications, suffers uh, serious liveness issues. So you have to, once you get your hands dirty with it, you realize that there, you have to, you have to fiddle with it to, so that it can be an actual live protocol. Any other questions? I'm not sure. I'm tracking the chat, I think. I think that's it. I would love to be able to dive uh, more technically, but I think uh, it's going to probably take more than yeah one yeah, minute. Sure. Right? <laughs> sure enough. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe if there's a if there's another break, we can. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Take a look at uh, exactly. <laughs> okay. Then uh, with that, uh, thank you. Go. Sorry. No, it's just okay. Yeah, oh. yeah. So thank you very much, Greg. Uh, and now I would like to uh, introduce our final use case presenter, uh, Gerald Dashe, Executive Director at the Government Blockchain Association. Um, Gerald, are you here? I am here. Okay, awesome. The floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Frederick and and Jacqueline and everybody who uh, who's put this together. <clears throat> I uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is Gerard Deshay, the executive director and uh, actually founder of the Government Blockchain Association. Um, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so I'm not going to. We've got a very limited amount of time, so I'm going to rocket through this pretty quick um, and then try to leave as much time as I, I can open for for questions. Um, but the GBA, just to tell you a little bit about the GBA, we are a, a 51C6 membership organization, uh, which functions as a business league. We are global in nature, and our goal is really to help the public and private sector connect, communicate, and collaborate. So you'll hear me say that uh, many, many times. We have uh, government members in about 500 uh, different government offices around the world at the local, state, national, and international level. Um, and um, and so they are organized into working groups and chapters. We have about 50 chapters, 120, uh, I'm sorry, 50 working groups and 120 chapters. And then we do events. We do all kinds of online events, conferences, things like that. A lot of the membership in the GBA are also ACT IAC uh, members. We've had just tremendous collaboration. One of the things we really appreciate about ACT IAC is just the exceptional uh, leadership and members that they have. So. Uh, many of the folks on the call are both GBA members and ACT IAC members, and uh, it has been a—it's just been a fantastic collaboration, and we uh, we look forward to to just a lot more great collaboration in the future. <clears throat> Let's go to the next slide. Um, to tell you a little bit about the organization that put the 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 blockchain maturity model together, and I'll explain what it is here in just a moment. Um, but it, it's a group of about 53 members representing uh, folks from all over the world, many different industries. Uh, both public and private sector, uh, every, everything from CIOs, uh, business leads, uh, uh, technical folks, um, uh, marketing, uh, you know, just to, if you look at <clears throat> all, academics. So it was a very well, well rounded group <clears throat> that, uh, that put the blockchain maturity model together. Next slide. And so why do, why do we put this together? <clears throat> uh, organizations around the world are, are in the process of building uh, acquiring and building uh, blockchain-based solutions. The problem is that they don't have the knowledge or the framework to be able to determine a good one from a bad one or to make uh, acquisition decisions, right, based on objective criteria. So <clears throat> that was that was sort of the impetus. That's what sort of drove um, uh, drove the, uh, the development of the model. Next slide. So <clears throat> The purpose of the model is really to provide a roadmap to help uh, people who are building blockchain solutions um, from startup to production. And I have a background with CMMI. I was a, a CMMI high maturity lead appraiser. And if you look at the history 
uh, CMMI and before that the software CMM and, and you go back even before that. What was happening uh, with, with software in general <clears throat> is that the Air Force uh, came to this realization and that is when they acquire software, it's usually, um, it's usually late, behind schedule, it's usually over budget and when they get it, it doesn't work. <clears throat> Other than that, it was fine. So what they did was they, they basically went to MITRE, which is a federally funded research and development um, center, FFRDC. And they said, can you put together um, a tool, uh, a, a, a framework, something to help our software vendors improve the quality of their software so we don't have as many problems when it's delivered? <clears throat> and MITRE came up with essentially, what was a checklist, which eventually got turned into something called the software CMM, CMM uh, which then became CMMI, and, and since then there's, there's been a lot of other maturity models. But the purpose behind the maturity model is really to, to develop a, a framework to help organizations mature. And then what happened later was uh, uh, organizations started using that as a as a evaluation criteria in acquisitions. So it really is kind of a it's really kind of a blend of, of both. So so the the BMM. Uh, in addition to being that roadmap to improve, also is uh, helps the vendors uh, demonstrate that their solutions can be trusted. And then it provides acquisition professionals with the information they need to evaluate blockchain-based solutions. And when we, when we talk about a blockchain-based solution, we're not just talking about the layer one uh, protocol, <clears throat> we're really talking about the full stack. So it's the blockchain, it's the applications and smart contracts that, that sit on top of it, but it's also the supporting ecosystem. Uh, because what, like we we just heard in the in the talk about our chain, if um, uh, you know if 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 you don't have um, uh, 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 node hosts and validators that that can afford to pay for um, uh, the consensus and the vet and the mining and all that, then your ecosystem breaks down. So when we look at the solution, it's not just a blockchain; it's really everything that surrounds it. All right, next slide. <clears throat> So there are really two types of requirements in the blockchain maturity model. There's what we refer to as the generic requirements and expectations, and then domain specific. And, and what, we, um, what we realized as we were putting this model together, and we're, well, I'll, I'm about to say what the, what the um, generic ones are. There are certain characteristics of a blockchain solution that really are, apply across the board. Re regardless of what domain or industry you're in, there are certain things about a blockchain solution that should be in place. But there are some requirements that are heavily domain um, uh, related or, or constrained. So for example, if you take the identity management, right? Identity management, if you're doing a FinTech solution has to have very strict uh, AML uh, KYC, right? Anti-money laundering, that know your customer requirements, right? But if you're doing a, an identity ma management solution for a voting, in a voting context, you have to have permanent separability between the voter and the vote or between the user and the transaction. If you're doing it in a healthcare environment, uh, you might need to know that this data came from patient ABC, uh, ABC123. You might need to know uh, maybe their age, their sex, their blood type, their family history, or their medical history, but you can't know their name, address, phone number, or how much money they made, right? And so what we realized is in every industry or domain, we needed a specific set of requirements. And so I'm gonna show you the generic requirements first, and then I'll give you an example of one of the domain specific requirements. Uh, so next slide. <clears throat> yeah, so we can, next slide. So the BMM core elements, there are, there are 11 core elements, <clears throat> and these are characteristics of a blockchain um, that should uh, be applicable to any blockchain. And um, you know, distribution, uh, governance, identity management, uh, interoperability, performance, privacy, reliability, resilience, which we also refer to as fault tolerance, um, security, uh, infrastructure, sustainability, uh, initially, this was sustainability, and so we were looking at things like the UN SDGs and ESGs, and um, we just found it, it was, it, we had a very, very hard time nailing down the jello. Um, so then we, we then backed that off to infrastructure security. And then synchronization. Synchronization was initially called um, uh, consensus, but what we learned was that there are a lot of blockchain solutions that achieve network synchronization without actually doing consensus. And I, I gotta tell you, this was a very informative uh, experience that this, we've been working on this model. Really, we started in 2008, kind of lightly, the, the last 
two, now almost three years uh, pretty intensely. Um, but as we were developing, we said, hey, all right, does this work for Bitcoin? Does it work for Ethereum? Does it work for Hyperledger? Does it work for Hashgraph? Does it work for IOTA? Oh, it doesn't? All right, let's go back to the drawing board. So these characteristics <clears throat> that we uh, labored over for, like I said, intensely the last two or three years, uh, really, uh, really um, are um, uh, technology agnostic. <clears throat> right, next slide. So in each of those 11 elements, <clears throat> we broke them down into five levels, right? Level one is, is a concept or the solution mature, mature enough to be funded, right? Level two is, is a solution mature enough for a proof of concept? Level three, is it, is it mature enough to be released into a live production environment? Level four is, is the production solution mature enough to be deployed at an enterprise level? And level five is a solution mature enough for a public sector or global deployment. <clears throat> we, we looked at these levels in terms of where the industry is right now. We really anticipate that a lot of assessments essentially are gonna be at the level one or level two area uh, you know, in the, those races. We're really not expecting hardly any solutions to be assessed at level five. I think it'll be several years before anybody gets there. Um, but we need to kind of get started somewhere. And so these levels were really, um, they were designed really around kind of where the industry is right now. All right, next slide. <laughs> so like I said before, we, we, can't, we, we have, like I said, we have about 50 different working groups. So our different working groups are working on various supplemental uh, requirements. So let me show you the banking finance as an example. Next slide. So the way the banking finance uh, working group structured their, um, uh, their supplemental requirements is they identified the use cases there in that first column, right? So, uh, uh, you know, a value transfer business, uh, individual banking, private banking, you know, things like micro lending, credit cards, uh, CBDCs, uh, capital markets, uh, structured products, exchange traded derivatives, um, you know, all of those, um, you know, cryptocurrencies, all, uh, DeFi, NFTs. So depending on what kind of thing your solution was doing, we then identified the, the requirements that, <clears throat> that were applicable to, to that type of a, of a solution. So um, your solution might require uh, auditable records, right? I mean, a lot of bank and financial systems function in a regulated environment and uh, they have to do reporting um, and most blockchains are not really capable of doing the reporting um, directly. All right. Or, um, uh, so anyway, so um, they've got to have an interface to a reporting system, right? And they've got to be able to keep records in a way that allows them to be auditable by, by third parties. So there's all, uh, you know, all of these, um, all of these requirements, it's all spelled out specifically in the documents. But that this is the level, level of detail that we've gone into in the different supplemental requirements. All right, next slide. As we built the model uh, and frameworks, we wanted to be consistent with um, uh, what was already out there. So we looked at ISO 9, 000, or I, ISO um, 22739, and where the ISO is, they were basically focusing on coming up with a standard vocabulary. So we made sure that whatever we did was um, in line with that. And um, like I said, we've got a lot of folks uh, working with us that are also members of the ACT IACT that said, hey, there's this playbook that ACT IACT is working on. And we, we wanted to make sure that we were consistent with that. We didn't want to duplicate the work that any other organization was doing. We, we definitely wanted to supplement it. Um, we did find that there really wasn't any other organization. We looked at ANOTPO, which is the International Association of Trusted Blockchain um, Applications. We, we looked all over the place. We couldn't find anyone uh, or any other organization or framework that really that really had what we needed to come up with objective standards to be able to evaluate uh, or, or prove that a blockchain solution was, was good. But when we looked at the ACT IAC um, play, uh, playbook, we thought that the BMM really dovetails into that very nicely. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> and I'm just watching the clock here. All right. Um, so uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, ACT IAC play playbook, it really is a uh, a very sort of thorough and comprehensive method for an organization to prepare for and to be able to implement and integrate blockchain solutions. And along, along with that, there are several places where you have to do assessments and, um, uh, and evaluate your technology. <clears throat> so so we, we felt that the, what we wanted to do is create something that would support um, the ACT-IAC playbook and, and integrate with that well. 
Next slide. And I'm sorry I'm going so fast. It's not the way I, I typically I typically roll, <clears throat> um, but I, I do want to get to your questions. <clears throat> so what goes into a BMM assessment? Um, so uh, the assessment requirements are based on the following principle, right? Assessment requirements shall be agnostic to the selection of any blockchain solution, um, apply to the full stack of technologies from the blockchain applications all the way uh, to the top, um, evaluate in the context of the opportunities and constraints that exist for the solution. So let me explain that just briefly. Um, I, I did when I, I, I've done a lot of assessments in, in my career. And sometimes, you know, the textbook might say, you know, you have to do all these things. But the reality is you might work in an environment where you just can't do those things, or it's just not possible. And so we wanted to, to, to ground it um, sufficient that there was a degree of reasonableness. So if something wasn't perfect, it wasn't the end of the world. But at the same time, we weren't going to rubber stamp everything. And so this was a really, really tough um, thing to hit that, that we want to create objective criteria, but we also needed there to be flexibility to deal with the realities of, of the, uh, the industry as it exists today. And then so, so because of that, assessments are conducted by a qualified team of ex experts that is, achieve consensus in the outcome of the assessment results. So, um, so there, there is objective criteria, but then there's also kind of like a jury um, consensus kind of, kind of thing to help, um, help mitigate that. And then the bottom line is the assessment results are really intended to provide value to the recipients uh, of the assessment. Oh, sorry, next slide. I keep trying to advance the slides. We then built, built out a full assessment methodology Right, which includes self-assessment, uh, uh, appraisal team review, and appraisal conference, rate right, and deliver findings. And the idea here is it's not really a pass-fail, it really is a journey, right? So the assessment team can be comprised of both internal and external folks because we wanna have a blend of both objectivity and insight. It is intended to be a collaborative process and, and we work, as opposed to kind of coming in and taking the test, we work together to help get that organization, that, that, that solution to a level of maturity that we can baseline and say, hey, you know what? We've hit level two, we've hit level three, et cetera. <clears throat> so it's really focused as a process improvement model. Next slide. So an assessment team, uh, and again, this is just real high level, the, the assessment team shall be comprised of folks that have at least two years of experience with blockchain or cryptocurrency, uh, be a GBA member in good standing, complete the blockchain foundations course, complete the blockchain maturity model course, and then have a certificate in one, one or more of the following areas. So the team as a whole has to have at least one expert in blockchain technology, one in legal and regulatory, one in the domain expertise, and then one as a digital asset manager. Um, and again, I, I don't have time to go into the details of all of these, but, but the assessment has got to have people that have a variety of perspectives so we can fully illuminate uh, the solution and identify any, uh, any risks. All right, next slide. So our, our assessment team leadership, Maya Penn is out of Dubai. He's a GBA director of standards and certifications. He's also an Intertech ISO lead auditor um, and uh, a client manager. Uh, Dino is, um, he's a chief information officer at the United Nations for the Joint Staff Pension Fund. He's also the United Nations Digital Transformation Lead. Um, in his role, uh, he has oversight over all of the UN uh, uh, programs. So that's the World Food Program, the World Health Organization, the World World Trade Organization. Um, so the CIOs and CTOs of, of every UN program essentially is under his, his guidance for leadership. And then we have this guy named Fred DeVoe, who has just been uh, outstanding. Uh, he, is a, he is a BMM lead assessor. We're actually, um, you know, we're actually working on an assessment right now. Uh, he's uh, the vice president of uh, Prometheus Computing and he is, he's been our primary liaison uh, with ACT-IAC. All right, next slide. So our roadmap is from 2018 to 2022, we went from concept to release. We made a commitment we were gonna release on April 30th. We, we, uh, we actually released it on April 30th at like 11.55 PM. Um, in, on April 7th, we had our first uh, agreement. We're now in the process of uh, uh, about to start that assessment. So it's taken that organization this amount of time to kind of get ready. What we found with most organizations is that when they decided to go down this journey, somebody came up with a great idea. They put together a pitch deck, they raised some money, they hired a bunch of uh, coders to start coding uh, an MVP or, or, or something. Then they raised a bunch more money. 
but they never really built the infrastructure to be able to be sustainable, right? They, they didn't have the documentation and uh, the stuff that they needed to be able to survive the loss of a critical personnel, right? And so when we started looking at these organizations and said, yeah, we're ready, we think we're level five, what we realized was they, um, they, they had all, all the, the gift wrapping paper on the outside, but there was nothing, there wasn't a whole lot in the box. So it's taken them some time to, to solidify their foundation so that they could be trusted. <clears throat> so in 2022, we, we did the BMM uh, release, we did the training release, we, we, we prototyped several assessments, um, which included, uh, the, well, <clears throat> uh, just out of confidentiality, I probably shouldn't go into that, but Another thing that we found as, as a major problem is what a lot of these, what a lot of these solutions had done is they went to, uh, to Azure AWS, they had all of their nodes under the single control of one CTO and all on a single cloud provider. And uh, in, in the example of one of the companies that we worked with, um, that cloud provider one day turned off the switch and their blockchain was gone. And so we started identifying all of these really rude fundamental problems that, um, that these organizations had. In 2023, we're gonna take the feedback and the lessons learned from everything that we, we uh, went through in, in this past year and released version 1.1. We're gonna to continue to roll out supplemental requirements and then and uh, we're gonna you know, globally scale our BMM assessment team. I'm oh, sorry, next slide. Yeah, Gerard, yeah, if you, if you wanna have one minute for a question, we're gonna to have to- uh, Gotcha, to, all right. To get it. Um, if you want more info, well, I'm just about done. If you want more information about the blockchain maturity model, you can go to go to the last slide real quick. Go to the last slide. Uh, yep. Go back one, just real quick. I just want to show them how to get to the all the information. All right. If you go to the gbaglobal.org site on the left side where it says resources, you'll see blockchain maturity model. It'll take you to a page where everything is there. All right. And then go to the next slide. That's that's where you can download the link uh, or to this presentation. And um, and that's it. I'm sorry, it was a lot of information to go through. What is fast like any questions no yeah th thank you so much uh maybe like one very quick question are any fed federal agencies that are using uh this model right now for 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 their pocs for their no well we have told them not to right uh it's too it's way too early for them to say that this is a standard uh we have taught we we are in conversations with several municipalities um in uh in, in florida and in utah um, that are that are looking at this, but they don't. They're learning about this right now. So I think I think the most important thing is from an education standpoint. Not necessarily. Um, it would be entirely the wrong thing to do to impose this as a standard at this point. It's just too Sounds early. Good. Well, thank you very much, Gerald, for this uh, presentation. Uh, thank you to all of uh, today's use case presenters. Uh, for everyone in the audience, uh, today's summit uh, will be provided via a recording as well. Um, I would uh, now like to introduce our final speaker for today, uh, Nevin Taylor, uh, who will provide uh, the closing remarks. Uh, Nevin uh, is a two-term White House Presidential Innovation Fellow and the founder of the Federal and National Artificial Intelligence Institute. Um, it creates transformational technologies that serve as a catalyst uh, to optimize mission effectiveness. Um, Nevin, take it over, please. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, yep, we can hear. It, thanks. So as most of you remember me from my 38 year affiliation, I recently retired from the federal government uh, in my time at DOD and DOS in the White House that kind of frames my view and my perspective of things. And, I, and I'd like to first say that I firmly believe uh, in, in the, the benefit of this public-private partnership and it's vital for the future strategic competitive advantage of the US. And, and as such, ACIAC serves as a critical role to driving this. So this is an amazing conversation as always today. Uh, I was asked to provide an operational perspective of where blockchain has been, where it is and the potential it offers the vast information uh, uh, that this phenomenal uh, technology provides, both in its depth and its breadth, um, and kind of bring to summation everything that's provided at today's summit. Um, sounded like a pretty easy task when they asked me to do it, but following the summit, I'm not sure that that's actually possible. This was amazing. Um, the panels were insightful, the information presented, uh, 
you know, and, and to put this all into, a, you know, the, an overarching synopsis uh, would be uh, difficult, if not impossible. Quite frankly, I'm humble to speak to and follow this distinct group of subject matter experts. Um, and so uh, with that, uh, I know that I'm all that stands between you and the conclusion of today and lunch. So uh, I will endeavor to elevate the conversation to an incredibly high level. As I think about this, um, you know, one of the things is I think we all understand it. And I, I, on that, after today, there's no question. Uh, I think the challenge here is to, to be able to explain it, what we used to call a 30 second elevator speech to uh, sometimes senior leaders and other people so they can appreciate and better understand what it has to offer. Uh, next slide, please. We're all, so that will be my kind of focus today, my goal, if I will. Uh, we're all aware how the market performs from the just traditional direct trading, uh, you know, historically to uh, when we introduce currency back trading to, to facilitate the marketplace, uh, which is illustrated, of course, in the first column. Uh, and this uh, attempt to illustrate the difficulty of finding matching buyer with seller and finding the right buyer for your product to optimize profit. Um, you know, we, we, we go, the instant goal is to drive, of course, the strategic competitive advantage and deliver value. Uh, in the second column is, is a, an illustration to show um, how this over time through the industrial age was an approach to familiarize and, and provide uh, for the future. Uh, but in the third column is where the digital domain lives. And we've talked a lot of that today uh, and how it, it is evolving in society as we know it as we transition into the information age. Each demonstrates the need of how transactions are conducted and the growing need for a reliable and accountable system that is responsive to the growing demands and the signals of our customers. Third slide, please. Uh, this is an effort as it has been addressed at the summit as blockchain serves the established to establish credibility, you know, build confidence and create a, a, a trust in today's volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world. Um, as we have heard today, this technology's application is serving society well in its initial operational role. Uh, and and we, of course, we hope that it serves uh, the global market at large. These technologies open markets or barriers to entry, both in the investment in the first column, the procurement piece and the communication pieces, as we're all, all too well familiar. Next slide, please. Uh, the ongoing focus is illustrated through the use case presented today is an effort to leverage technology to establish credibility that creates confidence in the, in the transactions to reach the right participants in an effort to facilitate this process. The efforts to establish trust in today's digital interconnected world is difficult and an environment is designed to provide an amenity, the internet, and, and its basic attributes, we have to provide a mechanism to achieve this trust and this part requires accountability. Uh, we provide this through technologies like, of course, blockchain. Next slide, please. And forgive me for moving quickly. I've got trying to cover a whole a wide spectrum here. The core of this is through the distributed ledgers, as we all are well aware. Um, it is the core of the operating capability of this technology, whether it's and this is the key here, whether it's just not be just financial, as we all are well too well aware, but it also helps with logistic information management and the means to monitor and measure the validity of the transaction as well as served by this technology. Next slide, please. The key component to track and trace transactions is offered by referential data that is the core of establishing trust in the transaction. We are all too aware that the documentation of the is a pivotal process that offers accountability through the distributed ledger. With this in mind, I would encourage leveraging the ACIAC blockchain primer as, as a reference point of how to see blockchain in the playbook to know how to leverage it as, as, as a seminal document, as it is, of course, we all know a, a living, breathing document and continues to provide insights for all of us to use as referential material. Next slide, please. Um, so as we look on how to increase reliability and resiliency of blockchain, I have found that IBM offers a great article and the link is at the bottom for those who get a copy of these slides and I encourage you all to read it, um, that identifies those areas of consideration in achieving these endeavors. It offers consideration essential for operational agility while providing a framework to determine the, the return on investment or value proposition of this technology. Next slide, please. It is through this approach that blockchain can be a, effectively applied and integrated to provide operational agility and provide the means to discern the cost benefit analysis that qualifies and qualifies the implications and impacts of this technology. It is through this risk analysis that the means to determine the maturity levels 
as well as the options and opportunities to contribute to the value proposition is associated with these technology. That said, the benefit, as we all well know, is well beyond the monetary markets, um, you know, whether it be whether whether through information management to assure reliability and, and responsible access to data this could provide access to doctors to provide for an example instantaneous diagnosis that provides better prognosis with current patient privacy concerns next slide please this approach allows assessment of what to see, characterize the dependencies of these blocks through the correlation that contextualizes understanding, will provide the temporal mapping to show the trends as to how things are evolving. It is through these mappings that we are able to synchronize events to better understand the causality of of, of, of outcomes that are desired to be achieved. Next slide, please. In the end, I am extremely encouraged that these technologies will assist and facilitate more effective actions in our digital domain. Whether great trust and confidence affords more effective and efficient actions in today's interlinked world, we have the means to monitor and measure trust in transactions and the opportunity to assess and analyze the veracity of data. It is through the timeliness of information and the correlation of knowledge to contextualize our understanding of these evolving environments that blockchain is at the of our ability to synthesize an environment of trust. In closing, I'd encourage everyone to learn more about this technology and to share it in a way that people can understand it, not just know it, uh, so we can utilize it to increase our overarching trust and confidence in all our current and future transactions. With that, I'll turn it back to Fred and thank IAC support for this group and all that you've done in your amazing work in this, to, to evolve and develop this technology for, for actual application. Thank you so much, Nevin, for your closing remarks. Um, I think we have some time, so a little bit of time for questions, discussions, uh, if uh, you want to write your questions in the chat. I would encourage, we had a break and we had a major dialogue. I'd also offer this time back to a similar dialogue, whether it be with me or the other folks that were present today. Um, not often do you get such an esteemed group of subject matter experts together to have such a rich conversation. This is Sandy. I, I think there would be um, additional value in the government folks who are all on here who present it. Um, or newly out of government, because what uh, Nevin can tell you is that it's in the communications and the coordinations that go on between the agencies um, that we're going to progress a lot. So we heard a lot from um, Tammy and, and her colleague at uh, Treasury that was very valuable and would be valuable, I think, um, from what we heard from GAO. Uh, earlier and and um, from NIST. And so if those communications and maybe having a discussion between those folks um, would be a great follow-up over. Yes, definitely. And uh, and also to, to remind everybody in the audience, um, we have uh, uh, on Fridays, every Fridays, uh, except when it's like holidays and uh, uh, meetings uh, from 10 to 11 Eastern time. Uh, where this group uh, gathers and uh, uh, different people uh, can come and, and share their experience or uh, their knowledge related to blockchain and how that can uh, help uh, government agencies basically uh, 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 better uh, uh, leverage uh, that, that technology. So if, uh, if you are not part of uh, this group, um, uh, let us know uh, and, uh, and we'll add you to, uh, to our mailing list. Uh, and if, uh, as uh, Sandy and Evan said, if uh, you're also part of agencies and have proof of concept or ideas or, or problems uh, that uh, you would like to uh, to share, uh, we can also uh, discuss that during uh, during these times and see how uh, the different various deliverables can uh, can maybe uh, help you uh, kickstart your uh, 
blockchain journey, I would say, or continue it. Fred, I got to um, jump in right away because there's one thing like Rob Worman just posted on the Forbes article that I want to go look at, but Rob is the expert in shared services. And I know that there's a joint ACT IAC and uh, Shared Services Leadership Coalition event coming up in March. And to that point, one of the things I heard earlier, and I can't attribute to which speaker, but it is it, it just was right there in front of us. And it might have it might have been when Carol or right after no, it was Mark. I think it's what I was listening to from Mark from GAO. And what he was saying that this blockchain could be very valuable if you extended it to uh, what is done with the uh, QSMOs and how they manage, um, move away a little bit from the centralization, talk about the, the ledgers that Tammy described, the three-part ledgers instead of two, uh, or th I forgot the terminology, and all this could factor into uh, better management of uh, shared services across the federal government where there's many to one to many, and maybe Rob, if I'm not out of place, maybe you can come off and, and let us know what you heard uh, from folks like Mark or Tammy that might factor into a shared services discussion. Over. Thanks, Sandy. So, you know, the way I might address that that perspective is, is that um, when it comes to the things that we have organized around, with regard to shared services and the things that the agencies have in common around managing their funding and their and their money and their financials, or or managing their grants, um, you know, where's the opportunity for blockchain there? There there has been some exploration, at least on the fringes, around what the opportunity is for for blockchain and grants management, among other other things. Um, one of the challenges in grants is is an understanding that um, as you, as you issue grants out to grantees, they they themselves also have subordinate grantees, um, and 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 understanding the the providence, if you will, of of the funding as it is dispersed across that that ecosystem and and, and the outcomes that result from 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 that funding. So that's that's an area of interest for for those that are sort of stick, sticking their their big toe in 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 the, in the pool of uh of, of blockchain and understanding and understanding where the opportunities are um th there there's some interest in when it comes to grant grants management and understanding what the extent to which block, blockchain can play a role with respect to uh to to recipient funding and the outcomes that result from that funding and so forth so there's been there if if you do some googling i know we're sort of out of time here but if you do some googling on Grants management and blockchain, that, that would be an area of interest. Thank you, Rob. Uh, and um, yes, we're going to have to 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 conclude very soon and, and turn that over to either Rob or Todd to talk about the uh, the emerging technology COI, but uh, to um, to leave us mm -hmm. with one question that I think, I mean, a great question from Erica, um, and that probably will try to, to take it uh, into our Friday calls. Um, how would one uh, success, successfully answer the question, why do public agents need blockchain, which are inherently decentralized uh, technology if there is a central organization? So to ponder with, and now I'm gonna, uh, Todd or Rob, if you wanna take it over for ETCOI information. Sounds good, Rob, I'm happy to jump in, but uh, I trust your judgment on it. <laughs> no, please go for it, Todd. Okay, no worries. Well, I think you're, you're hearing some great stuff from folks um, across the spectrum here. And, and uh, something I really want to uh, draw attention to is that uh, the Blockchain Working Group is a part of the emerging technology community of interest. And there are a variety of uh, working groups that support this community. Uh, and as you've heard throughout the talk today, uh, you certainly are welcome to join us. Uh, the Blockchain Working Group meets every Friday at 11 a.m. I'm sorry, 10 a.m. My apologies. And I think Josh put some material in there for you. If not, please, you can always reach out to me or Fred or, Ed, or Rob, and we'll get you uh, linked into the right folks. Um, there you go. Thanks, Andy. And um, uh, so I encourage you all, please, not just to join a working group that speaks to your needs, but join the Emerging Tech Community of Interest. It's a great group. You heard from a lot of those folks today. 
Um, what was the next slide here, Fred? And we've got a couple of open positions out there too. This gives you a sense of the other places where we play. In, in addition to the blockchain working group, we have a DevOps working group, an IoT working group, uh, a quantum, newly emerged quantum working group as well. Um, and we have the accelerator, like you heard from, uh, from Jackie. Um, so uh, there are plenty of opportunities for folks to get involved. I encourage you to reach out. Uh, I'll put my email address in the uh, chat. And I thank you all for attending today. It's a great session. Well, with that, that concludes um, our Blockchain Use Case Summit for today. Again, thank you so much uh, for being there and uh, for all our participants, speakers uh, to be there. Um, and then I think that's it. Awesome. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.